Hello, and welcome back to the first in the third series of the Ricky Gervais Show with me, Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant. Hello there. And the fool, the round-headed buffoon that is Carl Pilkington. All right. We've been away filming um, our second series of extras, uh, leaving Carl to his own devices in a sweltering London. We've had a heat wave here in the capital city, haven't we, Carl? It's been hot, all right? It's been up to 100 degrees, record-breaking temperatures. Yeah. What have you been doing, though? Uh, sort of enjoyed it a little bit, was out and about. Yeah. Getting to see the place, having loads of walks, and I like to have walks. You know, watching what <laughs> like people do. Like a dog. Are doing. <laughs> Yeah, when when he jumps off the couch and starts <laughs> exactly. scratching against the door, Suzanne thinks it's time. <laughs> it's, it's, walk. it's just good thinking time, though, isn't it? Uh, as well, having a walk, you've got no other clutter going on around you, and right. you just think about a lot of stuff. And you know, like like say with the weather being hot and stuff, a lot of insects knocking about. Right. So I've just been watching them. <laughs> so so while we've been filming a TV show. You've been watching insects. Yeah, just seeing because everybody knows insects are out there, but no one's keeping an eye on them. <laughs> Why, <laughs> what are they up to? What are you worried you know, about, Steve? You won't be laughing like that if you if you'd watch them because th <laughs> they do some weird stuff and that yeah. is what I mean. What yeah. sort of stuff? Any examples? Uh, I saw a bee have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> you saw a bee have a heart attack. Yeah. How were you sure it was a heart attack? Because what happened? I'd, I'd been. Did in it the... clutch its chest with all six legs? No, I'd were there some of... other little bee paramedics? No, no. I'd, I'd just been out in the park anyway, just looking at you know uh, caterpillars knocking about, uh, <laughs> butterflies and stuff. So I was sort of. So, aware. so when Suzanne goes to work, she goes, "Carl, don't you waste the day just because you don't work at the radio station anymore? I want you to do some constructive stuff." And you go, "Yeah, I am. Yeah." And so, you, so in your head, suddenly goes. And he goes, he goes out, oh, there's a moth. <laughs> but, but the thing is, so, I'd been in the park and I was aware of the insects that are around us more than, like, most of the time. And I come out of the park, just crossing, like, a, a sort of a busy road and what have you, and I saw this bee to the right of me, sort of in the air, and it was a big one, and I was a bit like, oh, let's watch that. And, um, it just fell. It <laughs> fell from the air in front of me, and it was it on the pavement, and I thought, oh, what's going on here? And I, I looked at it for a bit, and it was really still. Gave it a little kick, just to see if there was any movement. Nothing. Stone sort of, what's the saying? Stone cold dead. <laughs> yeah! Stone cold be dead. So, yeah. uh, that, that I was... like the fact that this bee suddenly saw Carl and her heart attack. <laughs> yeah. It'd never seen anything that round before. Yeah. It just thought, it, it had approached him because he thought it was a sunflower. My right. God, it's a giant walking orange. Every dream has come true. <laughs> oh! No, but it just summed up life for me. I thought, that, that's, that's like us, isn't it, at the end of the day? They have heart attacks. Stress. <laughs> you put it down to stress, do you? Well, it's in London, isn't it? You know, everything has stresses from living here. And they are bald, aren't they? They've got fur all over, but they lose the... And always overweight. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fat, bald bee! Oh. So what did you, you, it fell to the floor and you, you instantly, you just kicked it, you didn't attempt no, to revive it. No, I waited a second it. and just looked at it to see if there was any, you know, leg movement or wing, and there was <laughs> nothing, and then when I sort of kicked it, it was sort of hard. It had hardened already, it was just... Rigor mortis had set in. Did it so put you in a bad mood for the day? Because I know things like that can just send you over the edge for the day. Uh, death and that does a bit. Suzanne doesn't like me talking about death. What riveting conversations do you come up with? No, just things like, uh, one of our mates has had a baby recently, and I just was saying, oh, when that's sort of our age, we'll nearly be dead. Think of that. That's <laughs> the first thing he says, there's a new life brought into the world. <laughs> I know! But when he's our age, we'll be dead. Yeah. No, it's Maybe weird. they'll let you do the speech at the christening. Yeah, it's just, you know, so like I say, just, just insect life and that, it's interesting. You say it's interesting, but do you care about really finding out about them? Do you really care about what bees do or what do? You look at them and you make up your own world. For example, it had a heart attack, it's stress, it's overweight. You know nothing. I, c I could probably, won't you, won't you look something up? You know, honeybees are fascinating. You know, uh, honeybees, they've been, they've been around making honey for a hundred million years. That's incredible. Their wings beat over 11,000 times a minute. And he's thinking, no wonder I had a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they're fat. Do you know, do you know, um, bees, like ants, are actually like specialised wasps. They're sort of, they're sort of developed from the same... Family. 
Huh? Family, like. Well, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me. Doesn't surprise you, though. Does it interest you in any way? Um, well, everything's linked to something, isn't it? It's like how they say we're from monkeys and that. Yeah. It's all the same sort of thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've been watching loads of stuff. I've been watching Ants. You mentioned Ants. <laughs> uh, I've had a lot of moths in the house. They're sort of sad I mean, you say it like it was a day. garden party. <laughs> no, yeah. it's, just, it's just all these things. You, you look at them. I mean, you, you go into the scientific bit saying, you know, it likes honey or whatever. Uh, it doesn't like honey. That The reason they store honey is to get them through the winter when there's not, like, nectar or nectar's hard to get and they store it. And they store too much, which is why we can skim a little bit off the top. We're like agents. <laughs> yeah, well, but but all I'm saying is I look at more about what its life is like as opposed to... Well, no, you to... don't. You don't. You guess. You make it up. You don't look into it at all. No, but you can... A bit of guesswork is you, you're pretty close to the truth most of the time. Why? Well, what do you mean? Well, I don't, I, that, that state statement sums you up. A bit of guesswork is pretty close to the truth. Because if you watch something long enough, is what I'm saying, you can see that it's it's a bit clueless. It's the same way about ants or, you know, they're hard workers and all that. I watch one, it's going back and forth all the time. They go one way and then they stop and go the other way. They try to look busy in front of the mates. But if you watch one... <laughs> If you watch one long enough, it's back and forwards, and it's like it's done nothing there. I'm gonna carry this twig back and forth until I can knock off it four. There's a lot of that going on. Is there? Because uh, there's not! There's none of that going on! There is. <laughs> no, like I say, the moth. Depressing little... sort of thing. <laughs> Why is it depressing? Just... just the way it ain't got, it ain't got eyes, has it? You just look at it, it, hasn't, it doesn't know what's going on, I just don't th I think if you haven't got eyes, you shouldn't have wings. <laughs> That's a rule. If we could put that into practice, please. <laughs> That's a great rule. That's a fantastic rule, isn't it? Yeah. If you haven't got eyes, you shouldn't have wings. Certainly true of people thinking of becoming an air pilot. <laughs> ah. You know, whilst you've been working on that, I've been travelling about a bit, just seeing, seeing the country and that. Mm. Went to um, Dorset, right? A uh, nice beach there. Uh, and you know those huts you get? Like a hut on the beach and you... Oh, where you get changed. You can get changed in it, but they, they're better than that. It's like you can put a telly in it, uh, sofa if you want. Oh, you don't mean the Victorian changing yeah, huts? Yeah, you mean like... things. It, it's sort of bigger than that. Yeah. And um, we were walking down there and there was a really sort of big fat family in one of them. There was about four of them. And you could tell that they'd never had a game of anything, do you know what I mean? They yeah. just sit down there eating ice cream, looking at the sea and what have you. And the weird thing is, the little fat kid, the youngest one, who must have been, I don't know, about eight, he was really fat, to the point of, you couldn't see his neck. Yeah. And he sat, he sat at the front of his mum and dad and his older sister. He sat there, and he had a frisbee, and I thought, look, they, they don't want to play with him. I mean, that's, that's an active game to play, isn't it? Yeah. Frisbee. As we got closer, he was just using it to eat Maltesers out of. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, even, again, you know, the one active thing he's got he's using it to eat out of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Extraordinary. And that just sums up what people are like now when it comes to keeping <sighs> fit and activities. Oh, that's fantastic. Were you sporty, Rick? Uh, I was, yeah. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Were you good at it? Um, I was good at some things. Uh, I was never good at rugby. Never good at cricket. Uh, I was alright at football. But those things were the more competitive things that were scary. So at my school, when you're surrounded by, like, people, are, <laughs> the fun is hurting someone. Well, it's weird you say it, because I remember the first day I went to play cricket, my mum said, as I was leaving, I was really excited about playing cricket, she went, be careful, I was walking across a playing field once, a cricket ball hit me on the head, I was unconscious for two hours. Freaked me out, on yeah, the well, way I to play cricket, I thought, okay, always t scared of the ball, because it's obviously, as you say, rock solid. I remember a couple of seasons later, I had to play rugby for the first time. As I was leaving the house, she went, be careful with rugby. I knew a kid once broke his back playing it. I was terrified of rugby. I mean, I was yeah, terrified scared, of rugby. Such a scary game. The ball came to me, I got rid of it immediately. It's uh, mental. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't understand. What, if, what I remember is, I remember a teacher saying, you've got to play it very carefully because you can get seriously injured, you can hurt yourself, you could be crippled for life. I remember thinking, why are we allowed to still play this game at school? I was worried about cracking heads. Yeah. And a finger in the eye. How is it not bad? That worried me all the time, a finger in the eye. Like, uh, but they removed the asbestos from schools in the 60s and 70s. But yeah. rugby, is not allowed to play. It's mental. Yeah. You see, I, I had a mate called Mark who liked playing cricket, right? 
And when I when I used to say to my mum, "Oh, can I? I'm just want to go out with Mark and his dad to play cricket," and she never used to let me go. She'd go, oh, I'd "Prefer you know you didn't." And I used to always think that you know it's, it's because it's a dangerous sport. You can get it on the head by the ball and it's hard. Put an eye out or whatever. But it was because his dad his dad used to drive us to the place to play cricket, and he had um, his eyelids were too big, so it, it, he used to have to sort of have his head right back. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those old fashioned dolls right. where you can yeah, lean yeah, about yeah, yeah. and they clunk back yeah. and clunk forward again. And she didn't uh, she didn't like me getting in a car with him. So is this whose eyelids are too big. You so uh, growing up you had a woman who had her head like a bag of spuds. You yeah, had, but I didn't know her. No, you had two kids at school with webbed hands and feet and big heads. Yeah. You had a pigeon chest boy. Nowadays you're walking around with insects and moths like something from James and the Giant Peach. Yeah. And you had a, a bloke whose eyelids were too big. One thing I've, I've noticed that, because I occasionally go to the gym, and you know those guys who work out constantly to give themselves extraordinary physiques? Just they, you know, they're on the trip, they're on the weights, and they're really... And I've noticed in the summer, particularly, those guys cannot wait to get their shirts off. Yeah. Everywhere you see, they're walking around. If they've got a good, good torso, they are walking shirts off. Even, I think, if you go to nightclubs, I notice there's always one guy who's thinking, well, I have put so much work into this body, I have got to get my shirt off on the dance floor. A vest, yeah. You know, it comes straight off. A brand new tattoo. I'm not covering that up. Exactly. I've paid a lot for it. Let's see it. Yeah, yeah. But that's what we were saying about bodies. I can't remember why we were talking about it. We've got to a point in science now that you can change a head. No, well, that that doesn't make any sense at all. It it was a programme on... It was done in the 50s or 60s where they stuck a a monkey's brain on a stick and had it wired up and it still worked, right? Right, okay. And that was in, like, the 60s or Right, okay. Well, so, to, well to, to say to change a head makes no sense at all. Because just, if you put a, a, a different head on a different body, you're changing the body. Yeah, I know. Well, that's what I'm about to say to you, though. What? That's what I'm saying. That I'd be more confident if I had someone else's body because if anyone dissed it, I can go, oh, no, it's bad, isn't it? But it's what not are you mine. talking about? Well, it's, it's like, say, um... As opposed to someone else's head? Yeah. Well, what, it wouldn't be me, would it? My, the head is me. Well, of course it is, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, so what do you mean? Me. You'd be happier having someone else's body. What, than your own? What I mean is, say if, um, you're wandering about, uh, for some, for some reason, there's an incident. You have to take your top off and that, and everyone's looking at you, right? And you're a bit, sort of, you know, you haven't got the muscles and that, you haven't got the six-pack. Right. Uh, which isn't that nice anyway. I don't know why that's become a nice thing, really, seeing the insides of you. You might as well. <laughs> I mean, not. I know I came up with the see-through skin idea, but it's it's a bit weird, isn't it? You can see stuff. No, no, it's the muscle in front of the... No, it's not. Sometimes it is. You can it's, see not the, like it's not the tubes. outline of your no, organs. No, you can't see tubes. You can see tubes and veins and stuff. Well, you can see veins. Yeah, well, I don't want to see that. That's why we've got skin over it. Well, what stop I mean. looking at naked men, then. Well, no, you but sometimes you can't help it because it's been hot, and it, like you say, there's people walking around with vests on and that. So anyway, what I'm saying is, say if some incident happened, I'm walking about with my top off. Right. Girls are laughing at me, right? Why? Don't know, they might. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. So, they wouldn't look at your body, they'd all look at your head. So, so what I mean is... Yeah. Rewind that, right, and imagine all that happens again, but I've, I've got someone else's body. Right. Whose right? body? Uh, just some fella who's died and I, and my body was injured and they said, we've got a new body in. You right. can have it. We'll yeah. stick your head on it. Yes. Yeah. Now say if... if They're laughing at you. Uh, They're they laughing, laughing at the body. They're laughing yeah. at the body. Yeah. But at least I'd be able to sort of go, I know it's a mess, but it's not mine. At least I don't have to claim ownership. So, so all of this extraordinary technology that can make a head, put one head on another person's body, so you can go, ah, it's not my body. Oh, no. But, and but it's not your own. I'm not being funny, though. So if you have a body transplant, right, and you're there, you're at home, yeah. naked, you look down, yeah. lovely penis and a set of testicles. Yeah. Right? What do you do with them? What do you mean, what am I doing with them? Well, do you like them? Well, you wouldn't you wouldn't mess about with them as much as if they were your own. <laughs> but if you did mess about with them, would you feel guilty that you were messing about with another man's testicles and penis? And it's the full body. Yeah. No, because th they're not my hands either. Genius!
genius. You're a fucking genius. So what you're doing is watching someone else wank. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing Carl has been doing over the past few months is writing his diary. He's kept that up. Um, I don't know what he's had to write about. All he's been doing is looking at moths and ants and bees and going for walks. But I'm sure it's all in the diary. So, uh, let's have a look at that. Oh, I don't believe it. He's only gonna run it down the... We went to the park and had a brew. Suzanne read the paper while I played with a ladybird. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like a child, isn't it? It is like what a child would do. Like. Suzanne read the paper while I played with a ladybird. <laughs> His only friend is a beetle. <laughs> it climbed up my arm. It struggled on me hairs. This is in detail, then? Yeah, 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 yeah. It kept stopping every now and then and was rubbing its head with its right arm. It did it about four times and always used its right arm. It rested for about five minutes, then flew off. Sunday. Had a bit of a to-do with Suzanne because she wanted a lion today. I ate this. Once you're awake, you should get up. I got up and put the radio on really loud. She eventually got up. I told her insects don't have lions, <laughs> so we shouldn't. <laughs> I mean, you must be fucking unbearable to live with. <laughs> you must be a nightmare. No, I've just started, because I've watched insects a lot, I don't want to keep going on about them because we're a bit insect heavy, but at the end of the day, if we, if we copied insects, we wouldn't go far wrong. I don't know what you mean, though. One minute you're saying they're great, then the next minute you'll slag them off. Yeah, I'll slag some of them off if I don't know what they're doing, but because I've studied them a bit longer, I just think they, they do. You it haven't right. studied them. He, he thinks he's like Darwin. You, but you just slagged them off and go. No, you think people, the insects are doing stuff? They're not. It yeah, goes there, then it goes back again. The ant was. The ant was messing about, but only that one. The others were carrying stuff. That's what I'm saying. These snidey ones in everything, in every everything in the world, <laughs> you get a hierarchy. <laughs> oh, long words. Ooh. The bookshelf was dusty, so Suzanne asked me to dust it if I get a minute. I ended up looking at every book. <laughs> Just the spine. Yeah. Just for a few seconds each. Yeah. Didn't open them. I looked in the dictionary to see if the word dictionary would be in the dictionary. I didn't think they would bother with it being on the front page. But it was in the book as well. It's a good point though, isn't it? No, it's not a good point. Because you didn't tell us anything. Dictionary is in the dictionary. Well, of course it is. Well, why? If if you go, how do you spell dictionary, you look at the spine and you go, oh, there it is, D-I-C-C, -C, and all that. <laughs> so what, is, what does dictionary mean? It's a book full of words, isn't it? That's what it means. All books are full of words, you idiot. How to spell them. And if you don't know no, what it is- No, it's not how to spell them. All right, then we'll- I'll just look up something- No, 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 no. It's not a book full of words to tell us what- No. It's the meaning. Give us it's the, the definition, definition of dictionary. Meaning. It's a book full of words if you want to know what the meanings are. But if you didn't know Well, that, that's sorry, what was that sentence? Yeah, but what I'm saying is if you didn't know that, then you wouldn't be looking in it because you wouldn't know the book is about that. So, if you don't know the word dictionary and what it <laughs> means, you wouldn't be looking at the dictionary. You'd be looking at an A to Z. <laughs> because you Why leave it out, though? Just because there's so many words in the world, I, I would have thought they wanted to cram as much as they can on a page, and if dictionary is already on the front... Is that why you suddenly used the word hierarchy for the first time ever? Did you find that in there? Did you look at- did you see hierarchy in the dictionary? I feel I that, that that, that big word has pushed out about 26 <laughs> other more useful ones. <laughs> yeah. No, well, Suzanne's been going on about me learning another language, but I sort of think your brain has only got so much room on it. And the rest of it's filled with lard. So, <laughs> if I've got to learn everything I know, again, but in a different language, it's taking up space, isn't it? You don't learn everything, oh, God. It's all, what it's all you storage, mean? isn't it? But you if don't I, have to learn it again, you don't have to learn the concepts again. You're merely learning vocabulary. Do you know how vocabulary. many moves there are in the human brain? You really, you, don't worry, you won't use them all up. I feel that he has reached his capacity, though. Yeah. Well, you need a, another sort of, you, you need an update. You need some more memory. Woke up to some interesting news. It's good when this happens because it sets me up for the day ahead. If it's miserable news, it affects my day. It said on the news that they have found two new flies. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell, more insects! What have you done? Is that all you've done this summer? Bong. <laughs> trouble in the Middle East. Bong. Two new flies found. Ladybird climbs up arm. 
<laughs> they were found in the UK <laughs> and they were found close to each other. Maybe this happened because they were different than the other flies and weren't expected to hang about together, so that's why they knocked about with each other. That would happen, wouldn't it? What do you mean? There's two new flies. <laughs> what do you mean? Does it mean there are two new flies that are a different species? species? Yeah, two new species, and they found them close to each other, right? Yeah, and but they, they didn't mean there was one of each. No. Yeah, yeah, they did. They found two different ones. No. No, they have. Seriously, I know that. That's right. That's a fact. So you've got like, I don't know the names of them. They give them odd names, don't they? Well, say <laughs> yeah. you call it A and Fly B, right? Yeah. Fly A, I don't know. Uh, was say that's orange. <laughs> this is just B. Fly B, yeah. No, this is painful. No, this but is I'm just painful. making it easy. But Fly B wears okay. a little hat. He's got a little hat. Right, yeah, fine. Now, they found the orange one. I went, look at this over here. This is a bit weird. And they've gone, oh, that's a new species. Log it, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the other one went, oh, 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 keep your pen handy. Look at this one, it's got a hat on. So then they, they found them both within the same distance. I don't know what that sentence means. Keep leads. going, keep going, keep going. They, no, found, let him both, and finish. they I, found them both within the same but, distance. But without <laughs> interrupting him, <laughs> let him finish this, no, this point. Let me just make one thing clear. Carl Pilkins just said, they found them both within the same distance. <laughs> Think of that! Don't know what it means, but go on, let him finish this, this point. So. So what I mean is, they weren't knocking about with other normal houseflies because they were probably sort of going, oh, he's a bit weird. Leave it. <laughs> Yet because the other one was also odd, they're, not, they're hanging about with each other. Don't you understand that? Why is that such an odd yeah. concept? Because <laughs> you think, you think of it as like two little, um, uh, New kids in school. Yeah. They, they find out they're both new and they, they've got something in yeah, common. They're both, they're both goths, so yeah, they start hanging yeah, out together. Yeah. Uh, and this was on the news, was it? Yeah, just on the radio, yeah. I know if I looked into that story, it would be 90% wrong. Bit tired today because didn't get to sleep as early as I wanted due to a moth getting in the bedroom. Fuck <laughs> me! I got it in a glass and looked at it for a bit and then let it go because Suzanne wanted to go to sleep. Looked up some interesting news. Some people dug up an old body in Ireland. Turns mm. out it's well old and was here when dinosaurs were here. The really weird bit is it had hair gel in its hair. Right, what is it? A fella. Well, no, it wasn't around when dinosaurs were here then. Just a bit after. Right, fine. A lot after, yeah, go on. I, I think any hominid, anything that could even be linked to anything that may become man is only about a million years old. And I think Homo sapiens is probably only about... 150,000 years old. Dinosaurs are about 150 million to, to 250 million. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not the age bit, that's amazing. It's the fact of, there's a fella, won't have even had shoes on his feet. Right. And yet he was worried about his hairstyle. Right, well that's definitely not true either. This is unbelievable. Well, there was a man on the radio doing poetry, says Carl in his diary. I thought I'd have a go at doing a poem about today. <clears throat> not really. He had, Steve, I'm, I'm a little bit queasy. He hasn't really written a poem. He's written a, a small poem. No, he hasn't really. Yes. If moths had eyes... <laughs> Fuck me! <laughs> let, let me read <laughs> the poem, OK? <laughs> oh, fuck. He wouldn't interrupt T.S. Eliot. OK, 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 OK. Oh, OK. If moths had eyes, would they be happier? How do they know they're not dead? Cavemen hunting for food, but not before they style the hair on their head. <laughs> what would last longer in dinosaur times? A blind man didn't stand a chance. Not with all them rocks about. I'd rather be a blind moth. Right, <laughs> it may be the greatest poem no, ever written. Just, just, you know, dissecting it briefly, you attempt to rhyme in the first four lines, but abandon the rhyming system in the last three. Is there a creative decision have, for that? Can we have Carl read that? By Sorry, means, yeah. just, to, no, just, you, just you read it as you would like to... So this is, uh, imagine this, right, okay. This is going out all over the world, this, this podcast. And now, um, Carl Pilgrim, a new poet from Manchester, now living in, uh, London, England, would like to read, uh, a poem. If moths had eyes, would they be happier? <laughs> How do they know they're not dead? Cavemen hunting for food, but not before they style the air on their head. 
What would last longer in dinosaur times? A blind man didn't stand a chance. Not with all them rocks about. I'd rather be a blind moth. I think he feels. I think he feels as though the final line, "I'd rather be a blind moth," is going to be one of those great, you know, those, it, a summation that the, somehow the moth is a metaphor. I'd the caveman. Be a blind moth. No, but there's no I'm metaphor doing, in that. He really does mean he'd, he'd rather, rather be, be a blind, blind moth. moth. Yeah, well, I'm just because I've looked at the day's news. Can we always do that, Carl? Can we always find a day, right, and always sum it up in, in your in thoughts a poem. a poem, just like that? I love that structure. I, I love that structure. If there's any, um, English students uh, or professors, um, or novelists or poets listening, um, please email us what I thought of that poem, why it's good, why it's bad. So, you know, give us your thoughts, uh, on that. I mean, we would love expert opinion, um, poets, um, English professors. Uh, just email us at, uh, podcast at rickygervais.com. Mm. Now, Carl, apart from being a poet, you are an author now. You have, you've written a book. You know, which surprised me and Steve, because as Steve said, we, we thought you'd read a book before you actually wrote one, mm. but you've proved us, proved us wrong. And all your teachers wrong, and everyone in the world who thinks you're an idiot. It is actually a very good book. I mean, it, a, a lot of it is transcripts from, you know, the podcasts, uh, but you've answered some of uh, your critics, haven't you? And you've, you've tried to prove some of your theories. Uh, it's everything about Carl. It is, it is like... All the drawings. It, all the drawings. There's new stories, isn't there? I mean, there's so much effort, I can't believe it. He's been working on it for months, and it's out on the 18th of September, but you can order it now, can't you, on Amazon.com and Amazon.co.uk. What's that, what's that book called? It's called The World of Carl Pilkington. Well, thanks very much. Goodbye from me, Ricky Gervais. Goodbye from Stephen Merchant. Goodbye. And goodbye from the little hollow egg headed moron that is Carl Pilkington. Right. Well, episode two of season three of the Ricky Gervais Show, with me, Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant. Hello there. And Carl Pilkington. All right. What's been going on? What's been going on? I've been to hospital. I was rushed to hospital, right, emergency and that. I had a, uh, tube put on my knob. You had a tube put up your knob? Yeah. What was the story? Uh, kidney stones. Oof. So, shouldn't really be here, to be honest, doing this. He said rest, and that. Climbing them stairs on the way in. To be quite honest, it doesn't look like you're expending a lot of energy at the moment. It's it's like at Zookeeper going, oh, that sloth move today. Calm down. Yeah, but I had to get here. It's been raining. Yeah. I had to come up the stairs. I had to carry the computer. Yeah. Well, that's not entirely true, because your girlfriend was carrying it. I saw her outside. Yeah, but, but I'm just saying... And, oh. then you, and then you handed it to me and said, Steve, God carry this. Almighty. So yeah, I know. That's already a lie. Christ almighty. Whinging. Not whinging. I'm in show business. I know loads of people that wake up every day with a sore knob, feeling like they've had their kidneys probed, and they, they you know, they would say they're unconscious. So... They yeah. don't whinge about it, they get straight back onto it. They, you know, <laughs> a lot of them on TV now. Yeah, straight back to hosting game shows. <laughs> <laughs> so, you rushed to hospital. So tell the, take us through the, take us through the events, because it does sound quite dramatic. You started feeling a bit of pain, did you, initially? I felt a bit of pain, and I thought, you know, yeah, maybe I've just pulled a muscle or something when I've been wrestling with Ricky and that, because mm. you don't know what damage is being done. <laughs> Uh, so I just think, oh, it'll go in a minute, and then it didn't, it got a bit badder. It did, did it got badder, did it? So, then got I thought, I, I, oh, I, I was, I was crippled, I was lying on the floor in agony, looking on the internet, looking for a, sort of Still solutions. looking at monkey news. No, <laughs> I, <laughs> I was just, I just put in, like, bellyache and stuff, and they were saying <laughs> it can be loads of different things. Um, and I, what I used to do when I was a kid, I used to always just get a cold ashtray and put that on my belly. And the coldness used to get rid of the badness. <laughs> Amazing. The coldness got rid of it. Like a witch doctor. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This, this, this is like... <laughs> a witch doctor who happens to work in a pub. It's like a, some sort of fifth century remedy <laughs> yeah. written in mud. <laughs> yeah. Coldness doth get away with the badness. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, why specifically an ashtray? Just because they were at the sort of old cold. 
They're old I cold. But... I don't know what this is. I, mean, it's... I love this idea that he's, he, uh, he's uh, had the operation and he comes round and they're talking to him and uh, his, his girlfriend gets a phone call and, go, and, and they say, uh, Mr Pilkerton's it's got maybe complications, he's just talking rubbish. <laughs> yeah, she yeah. goes, oh, good. Yeah, he's back to his old self. <laughs> yeah. What, 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 is it, why specifically an ashtray? Sorry, because it's old cold, I understand it's old it's, cold. Oh, yeah, we understand, we, every, <laughs> everyone who's done a medical degree understands old cold, but, but, uh, <laughs> old, yeah. old cold belly badness. <laughs> if you want to buy that book, Old Cold Belly Badness, it's, uh, uh the, the yeah. history of abdominal surgery by Carl Pilkington. No, it just, you know, if, if, so, if but you, you put it in the freezer or something for You can do if you want, but they're normally cold anyway. <laughs> sort of thick glass and that, it holds the cold. But we're not smoking our house, so I had to use a plate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's madness. A plate's not gonna work. A pla Famously, a, pla a plate oh doesn't God, work. Oh, my God, no! So you put a, 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 uh, you put a plate on your belly, but that didn't yeah, do any- no, that, that, that didn't yeah. work, so, uh, called Suzanne and said, oh, I'm in agony here. She said, go to the doctors then. Good advice. So- A lot of people have done that straight away, <laughs> as opposed to going through the plate. <laughs> ashtray. ashtray <laughs> <laughs> so he went to hospital and he went to hospital and he said, have you got an ashtray? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they went, no, no it's just, an ashtray. This is no smoking. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so then we get in a cab and what have you, go there, I have an x-ray. His voice is even more boring than usual, it's isn't it? isn't it? Yeah. Fuck me. And they put me on a drip and everything, give me some morphine and stuff, and found out that I had kidney stones. So... That's why I was in hospital. And they get them out by... I can't even... I don't know what's gone on, to be honest. I've got some tube inside me. From my kidney to my bladder. That's helping me stuff get about. That's and so, there's a little tube up the end of your knob, into your... Yeah, it's not there now, it's right... it's high up. Right. So it's high up between my kidney and my bladder. But why didn't you have the thing where they go in the side? You had the choice to... Because I said to the doctor, I said, I'm not a doctor. I said, what do you he think? He went, stop putting yourself down, <laughs> Carl. He said, we need you in the operating <laughs> theatre now. He just said, you know, I said to him, what, what should I have done? Because he said, if you want, go home, um, and we'll get you in again or something. I said, something like that. And I said, no, I might as well have it done properly. Have it done now whilst I'm here. Sorry, the choice was have it done properly or go home? It was, it was something like that. He said, he said, there's, there's something you can do. And I said, oh. Flush it out. Um, no, because it's too big. It's something like seven millimetres. And it was, it's basically because you don't drink enough water. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, I said, what do you think I should have done? And he said, tube up the knob. And I said, hmm, not my favourite one of the choice, but if, you, if that's what you think. So he said, yeah, have that. He did me little diagrams, which didn't help. <laughs> he was like showing. How big like, did he draw your knob? Uh, <laughs> sort of normal size. Yeah, was yeah, it? It was all right. You weren't offended by uh, them. But he wanted into detail. It's just you know more the tube and stuff and your yeah. bladder and your. Kidney. What was your ball bag like? Did he draw that? He didn't did do that bit. He left that bit out. Okay, right. But, um, but he <laughs> said, oh, "We'll just pop that up there," and uh, and then that's when Ricky turned up to visit. They uh, came in laughing at me because we sat there in like me underpants and stockings. <laughs> in <laughs> yeah, stockings? Yeah. Yeah. Why were you dressed He was there, in? not, he wasn't in bed, he was sort of out of bed with his little drip, right? He had his little boxer shorts on, just sat there, right? In his pants, right? And he had stockings on. Yeah, because they stop clots or something. They put them on your legs. It's like, you know, when people have got big veins and they go on a plane. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. You said you're not a doctor. <laughs> no, but I've, I've seen it, because Suzanne's mum did it, and it was, she put them on ridiculously early, like three days before we were going away, and <laughs> she'd never been away before, and it, everything was like over the top, do you know what I mean? She was like, I best put them on. And, uh, so, so I put them on, and they like, I don't know what it is, it's something when you're in, when you're under, your blood doesn't move about the same. Right. And it can clot up in your leg. So you wear these tight tights. And I came in to cheer them up, didn't I? Yeah. Was that a nice cheery experience, him coming in? Uh, I had a headache at the time. I think he was a bit stressed out. Mm -hmm. uh, well, he's just a man you want at that, at that point. Yeah. Uh, he reassured you, I imagine. Well, it, it's weird how it suddenly all happened quick. It was like, as soon as he came in, it's like they got the finger out. And when I say Not that, literally. I mean, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I suddenly, I was being rushed down to, you know, have me stuff done. And uh, I woke up and there was an Irish woman over me going, are you all right? Are you all right? And I said, oh, it's stinging a bit. She said, I'll give you some more morphine. 
and I sort of put my head up to have a look at my tackle because I wanted to see if it was still there. What what was attached to it? Do you know what I mean? Because they said something about they might leave some string hanging out of it, so they can pull the tube out. It makes you talk. So, uh, <laughs> so I, had a, I had a look for that. Couldn't couldn't see any of that. Yeah. Uh, but as you put the morphine in, all the muscles in your body go funny. My head just collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> your head collapsed? You yeah, don't... I sort of looked up to look at my stuff, but then she said, oh, you just need a little bit of morphine. And she put that in, and I just sort of went, Oof. And then, uh, they sent me home about two hours after. But oh. I'm in agony now, and, uh... Are you in agony right now as we speak? Yeah. Certain. Now... Are you a man who's had this kind of hospital experience before? Is I this your whole first go. time? I don't go do it to hospitals and stuff because I don't like them messing about. Uh, but it does make you think now. Do you know what I mean? Like life and everything. From I mean, it's weird how it's all happened in the last month. From seeing that bee sort of die. No, no, well, not really. No, you, no, 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 no. This is not a near death experience. It is you a had a routine bit. operation to remove kidney stones because you don't drink enough water. No, I know, but... This is not a shark attack. Yeah, but it's all, it's all, uh, life-threatening, otherwise you wouldn't have to fill out forms, would you, saying, if everything goes wrong, Suzanne can have the house or whatever. And then you, you find out more about the body as well, which has been sort of doing me head in a bit. You're more aware of stuff in your body, which I don't like knowing about. Yeah. They keep taking your heartbeats and stuff, mm. and your blood pressure. I don't like knowing about that, I just like, leave it. It's happening. Don't be messing with it, stop measuring it. <laughs> Stop measuring it. No, do you know what I mean? Same no, with the knob. It's, it's that thing of, of like <laughs> they put that. Thing That's on. what the anaesthetist was doing when you were under, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. He was comparing the diagram to the actual thing. Oh god. The fella across the way from me had had the same thing as me, but he'd had it a couple of days ago when he was in agony. So that doesn't help when he's saying, "Oh, I've been to hell and back." Like, don't tell me that. <laughs> sure. I don't want to know. Just say it was it was all right and stuff. So uh, <sighs> it just the, the whole thing of a hospital is stressful. You know what I mean? They wake you up like every half an hour in the night, saying, "How do you feel?" <laughs> it's like, "Oh, what, you know, it's half past three. What are you doing?" <laughs> uh, I've got to have it done again in a couple of weeks because um, what they've done now, they've popped pop that straw up, but the stone's still in there because they didn't have the laser team in with them. Blast the stone, and then that time they're probably going to leave a little bit of string out the end. Then they have to go back three days later and they pull it out. Tell you what though, when you are sort of, because when you're in hospital, you've got a lot of time just to sit there and think about stuff. And uh, what I was thinking about is, what is the closest thing to sort of living that's nothing? I don't know what you mean. <laughs> what? What's like the closest, like, do you know at some point something's gone from nothing to something, hasn't it? No, I don't, no, I don't understand what you mean. Something, at, at some point, people were nothing, and then something happened and they were something. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But they were never you, nothing, you, were they? Do you mean what is the, the, the first and lowest and most primitive and most simple form of life? No, He's so, right here in this room, Rick. <laughs> say, say, like, when you look at a, a stick insect, right? you go, right, there's a slight crossover there from a stick to a living thing. No, it's not. It didn't used to be a no, stick. No, 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 it's not. There's no, there's no, there's no biological relationship between it and a stick. But the, there isn't much difference between the two, is what I mean. Of course there is. It's a huge there isn't. difference. They just, they just sit there looking like a stick. That's their skill. Yes, but there's nothing to do with being a stick. It's, it's like camouflage. That's like saying when a soldier puts on combat gear, you go, you're saying he's a cross between a human and a shrub. <laughs> He's not a cross between a human and a shrub. No, is but, he? That's, but that's that's man-made from a distance stuff. you can't see him. That's the same as the stick insect. No, but that isn't what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, have you seen them weird things that just look like they they, they sort of look like a leaf? Yeah, they're insects that look that that have evolved to look like a leaf. So a bird thinks, oh, there's no there's no tea there. No, that's not I, a juicy I, insect. It's a leaf. I don't eat leaves. Yeah, but Forget at some it. point, something has had it away with a leaf. No, what? at to no point has something had it away with a leaf. No, to make it look that much like no. a leaf. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> at no point did a beetle shag a leaf. There's nothing on a genetic level or molecular level, uh, an anything to do with it having anything to do with a stick or a leaf. It's superficial. It's the way it looks. That's all it 
it, that's like saying chameleons must have mated with green once. They are green. No, but it what, looks like a leaf. What I don't understand is it has evolved to blend in perfectly with its surroundings and fool predators. But then, how does it meet? How does it have relationships? It will be going around, sort of having it away with a leaf. <laughs> <laughs> no, it won't, because it doesn't know what it looks like. It doesn't matter. They do it with pheromones and attraction, and uh, it, it's not like they, uh, it, 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 you know, um, a stick insect will be talking to a stick for ages and go, oh, "I've wasted my time here." <laughs> This club's dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Rude. I was chatting to her. She was foxy, but she was giving me nothing. But, Dave, that's that's not a stick insect. That's a stick. What, what are you talking about? That's a stick. You've been talking to a stick all night. I, thought, oh, I can't believe it. I just thought she had a great f slim figure. No, no, it's actually a real stick. But I've been I've been reading a lot about you know I like spiders and stuff. Just reading about them. Mm. Uh, and there's one right. Mm -hmm. It's got big legs. <laughs> yeah doesn't use them. Um, it goes around floating in the air on a bit of webbage. Um, <laughs> like he just took a gamble then, didn't he? He took a gamble, he thought, do you know what, I'm gonna go with webbage. <laughs> Don't know if it's a word, not sure, but I could just <laughs> say web and I'm gonna go with webbage, I'm gonna risk it. <laughs> and it didn't oh. pay off, did it? <laughs> webbage! <laughs> webbage! But that's how it gets about, it's in the air like a kite. Yeah. It's just floating about. I've seen one, yeah. So, that's what I'm saying about weirdness. Mm. The way all that goes on, and this is what I can't get my head round. You, ha you have got your head round. <laughs> <laughs> but do, do they get ill, then? <laughs> it's just... For those listening at home, he has just bumped his head against the microphone. Trying to mate with it, because it's perfectly <laughs> round, this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> no, but when when I was like, this is what I'm saying. When I was in hospital and stuff, mm. you do think about how others live because insects don't have operations. Uh, are they built better than us to survive in this world? The trap you seem to fall into again and again and again is you cannot conceive of the fact that insects and animals do not have consciousness and personality and communication. They do not function in the way that humans do. You've seen so many Disney cartoons, you believe them now to have a life and wear bowler hats and go to work. But just in the same way that the cavemen didn't have Flintstone-type cars and have a little house, but you then, can't seem to understand that animals don't work in that way. But what I mean is, you're saying that no animals or insects know anything, yet when you see them things on nature programmes where a load of ants are having a walk, there's always one at the front who's leading it all. So one well, of them's got to know first. Or th there are leaders in, in. Yeah, but the other ants are going follow him. No, they're not. They're not. They're not vocalising that in any sense no, that you not understand it. No, they're saying follow him, but they sort of look as if to sort of say, "I'm but going without, this way." Without without knowledge, without, without cognitive speaking. reasoning. It's not made a conscious decision to act no. in that way. Yeah, but this is when you if get a bird, if a if a if a raindrop falls on a bird's beak and it moves, it's it moves away because instinctively it's hardwired to be wary of things which drop on its beak in case it's dangerous. It's not thinking, "Oh crumbs, that's I better get out of the way." It just does it because it's somehow hardwired into it to act that way, but it doesn't stop for a moment and think, which we don't really, except we then are able to rationalise our our fears and our actions. Well, I, I've been watching birds more than insects recently. Oh, in the, okay. In the, last, on from in the last week, just because so, I've sort of looked at the ant and the bee and that. And what I've found with pigeons is they've got wings, yet they walk a lot. <laughs> 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 that, I'd love that to be a thesis, where he got like a, a half a million pounds grant from a university, and I said, well, Pilkington seems to, he's done ants and he's done bees. Um, he's, he's followed ants. <laughs> Apparently they're not doing anything, some of them are lazy. Um, he, we are granting him another uh, half a million pounds. Um, he's been working on it for a year. <laughs> um, please welcome Carl Pilkington. Carl, what have you found? Well, even though pigeons have wings, they walk a lot. No, but even in times of danger, one was crossing the road and a car was coming, and you'd think that his head would say, best start flying. Yeah, he just walked faster. Well? Well, what's he doing? It was doing stuff, wasn't it? It saved a bit of energy. Takes a lot to take off, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's either that or, you, or you're going to get crushed. You but it didn't energy. get crushed, did it? Uh, no, I don't think it did, no. There you go, they knew what he was doing, didn't it? Yeah, it just annoyed me, that's all. It's got a... <laughs> 
It's got a power, and it's not <laughs> power. They, they, they're all super they're powerful. All, these yeah. animals. Yeah. But that's why he thinks of the stick insect <laughs> as as like that. He, you mentioned earlier that's its power, that's its skill. Like Spider Man was bitten by a radioactive spider, and now he can solve crimes and and uh, swing with webs <laughs> with webbage, using his webbage. Whereas, yeah, stick insects is not. It's not a superpower. But say if if everything was at the same size as us, <laughs> what would be the best thing to be? Say like a tarantula, yeah, and a tiger. What would happen there? T a, a fifteen stone tiger versus a fifteen stone tarantula. Yeah. Well, I'd imagine the fifteen stone tarantula. Right. So it's just weird that, isn't it? It's a good job that they're small. Yet yeah, things are getting bigger because we're messing with the world. But it's a ridiculous thing to say, isn't it? Because what would it eat? Fifteen stone. Well, it wouldn't happen anyway because the insects have a uh, insects and arachnids and uh, it just. Uh, invertebrate arthrop arthropods in general they have a um a critical mass because they haven't got lungs they breathe through things in their side called spiracles and if it gets too big the surface to volume ratio um isn't big enough to allow it enough oxygen so the biggest you'll find is like a foot long beetle or somewhat weird it's like big that. though isn't it yeah and that's about as big as they get He's so i wouldn't worry that. about it mm. <laughs> again Based on nothing, he queries it's not, you. And also, it's not a case that one that will be born too big and can't breathe, it won't happen. That's why they're only that big, because... But it's like fish, isn't it, how they say about a goldfish? Yeah. That thing about a woman who went on holiday and mm. stuck it in a bath. Mm. She came back, it was seven foot. Right, that didn't happen. No, that's a well-known thing about goldfish. No, it's goldfish. not a well-known thing. What? I'll tell you why, because a fish will only grow to its surroundings anyway. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. You have to put it in a bigger tank. Yeah, in a bath. No, a seven foot fish in a bath. It just fit the bath exactly, did it? When she got back off holiday. Don't talk shit. It's what was it eating? What was it eating? How long was she gone for? <laughs> Two million years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she she went to Mars and back. Yeah. It's just that fish are weird, aren't they? Well, though, there's, <laughs> again, no, that's a bollocks story once again. No, I well, don't know where you've heard it or read it. It's or, a well known story. A seven foot goldfish in your bath. But, uh, no, fish are weird. Ted, like you're that. not going to believe this. Come up here. Well, how many fish do you see that have naturally died? That's the weird thing. What do you mean? Just ping ponging around these ideas in your mind. You just never see fish sort of just floating about in the water and you go, oh, died of old age. It's always been caught by a man or a shark set it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't just see dead fish washed up, do you? When you think Sometimes. of the amount of fish, not when you think of the amount of fish that are in the sea, there's loads of them, and yet you never because they're eaten walk straight away. The, that's what I'm saying, though. Are they eaten when they're dead, or are they just being eaten? Well, most things that don't die of old age. Yeah, that's weird, though, isn't it? Well, no, because it's a, you know, it's a jungle out there. Yeah, no, that's why I said uh, oh, I wouldn't want to live in the sea because you've got. To are be you old. sure you're not on morphine as we speak? <laughs> No, but you have, you, in the sea, you've got to be constantly sort of alert, haven't you? Yeah, but that's stuff. true of all animals. No, worse than the sea. The sea is, like, full of... Uh, you've got an enemy around every rock. <laughs> I love it! I love yeah. it! I love it! It's like a warning to crabs. <laughs> exactly. And young squid. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's, it's like the policeman that comes into your school. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. What <laughs> advice would you give... OK, then. What advice would you give... Some plankton. <laughs> now, what advice would you give um, uh, a, a, a two-week-old octopus? Um, and what am I? Am I an octopus? <laughs> no, you you're, you're you. We've so, set it up that it can understand you with some sort of... Uh, one of your inventions to talk to the animals. One of your brilliant inventions is just to watch you strap on its tentacle and it can understand human talk. Um, you know, but, you know, I'm sure you'll, you'll come up with that one day. Um, what, what do you say to it? What would you say to an octopus, a young octopus, who wants to set out by himself in the sea? Stay, stay close to the rocks. Um, and just let it know about the thing about it can get into a small space. You know, if you look at an owl, don't go, oh, I can't get in there. And sort of squash it. And show itself. <laughs> I can roll it into a ball and sort of say, look at that. Is that hurting? 
uh, I love the fact that the drugs make no difference. It, it's like there's no difference. Oh God! Because that's the only thing that that's got in there. It's boneless. So <laughs> that's, its, that's its special power. That's, that's what it. it can do. You can roll it up, and uh, <laughs> as long as it knows that. But that's the problem with a lot of powers, isn't it? That's that's the same thing about how people say don't have a go at bees because they're not like wasps. They don't sting you because once they sting you, they die. That doesn't know that, does it? It's also not true, but yeah. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't know, so it's not like the bees going around going, I'm not going to sting you because I'll die if I do. What's your point there? I don't understand. I'm just saying... We shouldn't, we how, shouldn't how did, dislike bees. Uh, well, how, did, how do these creatures know what to do? Instinct. I suppose it's like that story you told me about the scorpion, isn't it? It's that, isn't it? What, the scorpion and the frog? Yeah. What, the fable? Yeah. What was it? It was a frog It was a, it was a uh, the scorpion needed to get across a, a river, and it said to a frog, can you give me a lift? And the frog said, well, no, of course not, because you'll sting me. You're a scorpion. And he goes, well, no, why would I do that? If I sting you and I'm in the water and you drown, I drown. And the frog went, good point. So... The frog get, gives him a piggyback, going across the river, halfway across, the scorpion stings the frog, and the frog's dying. And the frog's going, now I'm going to die, and you're going to die. So why did you do that? And the scorpion said, because I'm a scorpion. And what do you think that, that was meant to point out? Just sort of be careful who you help. No. It's meant to point out that you are what you are. You are your nature. No, but it's also that thing of like. Uh, I'm telling you, it's nothing to do with. If you're what the driving frog was th- no, and, and no, someone's hitchhiking, no, don't pick them up because. No, no, it's nothing to do mm. with the mentality or the reasoning or the, 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 the anything to do with the frog at all. The point I'm, of it. Well, I don't know. I think Aesop was thinking a lot about the hitchhiking problem. It wouldn't happen. That's the problem with a lot of them fables. They're putting animals together that wouldn't meet. Oh, whereas insects go around shagging leaves. Well, insects are with the leaves, whereas I don't know where a scorpion is knocking around with a frog. <laughs> I mean, there's that weird one I remember uh, <laughs> watching. Annoyed. I remember hearing something about this lizard that sort of gets pally with the scorpions, even though they're not mates, they don't get on, but they've kind of got this agreement that the the scorpion can live in their house if they guard it. And there's, there's, the local people used to stick their hands down these holes and get the lizards to make slippers out of them. And the lizards were getting sick of this. And I think somehow something happened where the lizards thought, look, enough's enough. Uh, we'll let you sleep in our den if you stand by the door. So the scorpion used to, like, stand by the door and stay awake at night whilst the lizard's having a kip. Fella comes along wanting to make some new slippers puts his hand down the hole, scorpion gets him. Now yeah. that's that's what's weird with that, that two it's, enemies have worked together. It's called a symbiotic relationship, but at no point did they sit down and go, right, what are we going to do? I'll tell you what, I'll give you shelter, you give me that sting in case uh, there's a fellow who wants to make slippers. Because all this happened way before people were making slippers. But isn't it weird though, because people, there's nothing that happens like that in people, is there? Of course there is. What, like that, where you don't get on but you work with them? Of course there is. What? Loads of business relationships. What's, what do you mean? No, but Team normally you stay... What I mean is you stay enemies. away. If someone's being a bit weird... You know, loads of examples where you might go, well, I hate to do it, but my only option is to go with X, Y and Z. But what, what I'm saying is, though, let me just finish. Go on. I, I live in an area where, you know, I sort of know a lot of the locals... And there's a local woman who's a bit mad. Yeah. Now, I know her, but I choose to sort of stay away because it scares you a bit, doesn't it, when something's like that and it's unpredictable. So, uh, you know, when I was in the little corner shop, she came in, right? Uh, she screams a lot, just screams for the sake of it. And you don't know if, if she's upset or if she's just doing it for attention, then the scream will go from screaming to laughing. <laughs> so you're like, oh, what's going on? And it was like, like rush hour. But it was like rush hour time in this shop, <laughs> and she chose to go in then. And she doesn't work, so it was like, why is she coming in now? She's had all day to go in. Mm. Just pick the busy time. Mm. And she was like about three places in front of me, 
<clears throat> and she was only buying a Yorkie and some earbuds. Right? And I thought, <laughs> a what? A Yorkie and some earbuds? Yeah. And right. I thought, what's the rush? You've come at the wrong time and you bought stuff that could have waited. You should never have to rush out for a, a Yorkie or an earbud, is what I'm saying. Right? Uh, and I ended up sort of going, oh, I can't stand this. And I left. Now, that was me being like I would expect the scorpion to be or the lizard. I don't know what you're talking about now. <laughs> I have I no don't know idea. Where the, okay, so what do you mean? No, I'm just saying how, like, I chose that that woman could be dangerous, so I'll leave, I'll leave her to it. And that's, that's where nature kicks in. And you go, I don't want to be here. I don't know what she's going to do. She's unpredictable. <laughs> I'll pop back later. <laughs> and then, I, you know, I look out, I can see the shop. I saw her go and she was, like, oh. laughing to herself again and trying to climb up some ladders. And I thought, once she's gone, I'll, I'll nick back. <laughs> I don't know what my point was. I don't know. <laughs> oh, he's only got to really down the round. That's the jingle for Carl's Diary. We had bacon and egg on toast. I'm eager to get through the brown sauce, as the bottle is too big to go in any cupboard, so it has to be left on the sideboard. <laughs> so I had about four dollops of the stuff. I love the, cons you know, that made it into the diary. He's concerned about the fact that the brown sauce know, is the, too the big, so he's rushing through it. I know, but I'm just saying the kitchen isn't that big, and it <sighs> looks messy when you leave stuff out, doesn't it? And we've got this giant brown sauce bottle, <laughs> and I don't want to chuck it away, because that'd be a waste. So you're having brown sauce and everything, and everything your cornflakes, yeah. in your tea. Yeah. A wasp got in the flat. You know trouble's brewing. <laughs> it was massive. The biggest wasp ever. Suzanne asked me to get it out, but I wanted to take a picture of it first. <laughs> I was getting my phone ready when it flew at me. I reckon the sting on it could have killed a kitten. <laughs> <laughs> so specific. It ended up flying out the window on its own. <laughs> Drama averted. Oh, God. We went out for tea. You're always in a calf. That's what it, this diary. You're all, you spend so much time in a cafe. There were loads of flying ants. I kept kicking the table because I could feel them on my legs. I wouldn't be that jumpy normally, but I still had flashbacks of the giant wasp from the morning. <laughs> Suzanne told me to stop being stupid because I was ruining her night out. A night out in a calf. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Oh, what, was, what, was her, what was it, her birthday? And flashbacks from an incident. Yeah. Like he's some sort of, like, war veteran. <laughs> what is it? It's the wasp. It could have killed a kitten. Bought some wallpaper. We got back and got on with it. The wall that we've papered before has got a big mirror under it. We papered on top of it again. I ended up reading my phrase book while Suzanne did the rest of the tidying up. Now, what's your phrase book? I don't... This is, this is just you trying to master English, is it? It's just a book that tells you... Little sayings and how they came about. An interesting phrase is pot luck. It came about when all people ate is stews. They used to chuck all sorts of stuff into the stew. You stuck your spoon in and sometimes you got something nice like beef or you could end up with a bit of frog. It's pot luck. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, isn't it? That's what it said in the book, did it? A bit of um, frog. Got up and checked the wallpaper out. There are loads of air bumps and it's buckled <laughs> on the joints. I wish we'd never done it. <laughs> Suzanne said the washer was broke and it's out of its warranty. She called up the people who made it and they said it will cost £150 to fix. I don't know how they know that when they haven't even seen it. I want to smash it to bits and see what they can do for others <laughs> as they could. <laughs> so much anger. <laughs> <laughs> I want to smash it to bits. <laughs> oh, that'd be great, wouldn't it? 150, you sure? Yeah, Come yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's just like a cube that's been yeah. through one of those uh, car crushers. Yeah. 150 quid, there's 150 quid, fix it. Yeah. I watched the news and calmed down a bit because there was a story about some Siamese twins who are having an operation. They've got two heads, four arms, two legs, one liver. The doctor said they will have one leg each. I felt bad worrying about the washer when people have bigger problems like the Siamese twins. Ricky and Steve asked me to do a poem about one day a week, so I thought I'd w do one today. I can't obviously do it justice, I should let the master read it. You've done another poem? Yeah, you said, you know, just just do one. If you have a day where you've had a lot of emotions. Well, I, I loved the poem, and so did uh, the listeners, and I knew they would, so if you can do that every week, that would be a joy well, you for can't, me. You can't force a poem, though. No, so I know. So a diary's easy to do, because you just write down yeah. what you're doing. But yeah. you, you've got to have some really meaty subject matter to be able to write a poem, Rick, as you'll discover. I know. 
Right, so, you know, you've heard what problems they had that day. Go on, then. Bubbled wallpaper. What a mess. <laughs> Washer dry and knackered. What a mess. Siamese twins separated. One leg less. <laughs> I don't know what rhyming scheme that is again. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> oh, fuck me. <sighs> well, there you go. That's the end of episode two of series three of the Ricky Gervais Show. Um, more next week. More drivel, more diary. Another poem, I hope. Maybe. Um, just more news and stuff. From me, Ricky Gervais, Steve Merchant. Goodbye. And Carl Pilkington. Right. Hello, welcome to number three in the third series of the Ricky Gervais Show. With me, Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant. Hello there. And of course, Carl Pilkington. All right. Had a good week, Carl? Uh, all right, just, just boring. It's a boring week. Because that, that sort of kidney operation I've had, um, it's just affected my life in a big way. How are you now, Carl? Are you feeling better? Uh, better, better than what was last week. Because last week you really were not putting the effort in, were you? And it's your own fault, you know, you've got kidney stones, you don't drink enough water. Have yeah, you no, well, that's, that's what I've been doing this week, just drinking, that's, th I mean, you, you said what, what sort of week have you had, what have you been up to, that's what I've done, I've drunk water. <laughs> that's all I've been doing. <laughs> if there's a water shortage in London, <laughs> it's because of that. <laughs> Honestly, just, that's what you have to do, Con it's sort of, it's just boring. Just like a, a basking shark, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> With its mouth open, just going through the water. Oh, sick of it. Oh, he's led the life of plankton for <laughs> one you, week. Have you been able to do anything, or have you just been resting? Uh, it's best to rest, um, just because you know your body's still in shock, even though in the head, physically, I thought it was all right. Uh, the body sort of just acts in weird ways. Brilliant. Um, you know, it's a weird thing, isn't it? Like I said last week, you you don't think about your body until there's something up with it. And then you panic a bit. And then you go, right, I'm going to look after it from now on. I've been given a second chance here. Uh, as I said before, this was not a <laughs> life-threatening illness or operation. No, but it's, it's that same thing. The last time I had it was when I nearly choked to death on the Mr Freeze pop. Right. Where I had that sort of, uh, what do they call it when you have like a second coming? Do you know what I mean? It's that sort of thing where <laughs> I you I don't go, think you're the second coming. No, but well, that, that thing of... If you are, we're all screwed. You mean the second chance? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a second chance thing. Your life flashes before you, doesn't it? Yeah, but you get, uh, you suddenly feel kinder. Do you know what I mean? You, really? You, yeah, you sort of go, right, you know, that was a bit of a warning. Be like good, Scrooge? Be good to people and stuff. Yeah, a little bit. I think it's normal. So I are think. you now a nicer person? You've given more generously to charity and the like? Uh, well, I haven't been out, so I can't do anything. I can't help anyone. Well, yeah. Go online. And but maybe, right. uh, yeah. you know, once... Donate some money, all this cash you're in. No, I've given enough money away. Sick of it. But, um... Oh, he hasn't changed. So he hasn't changed at all then, no. But you've also got to be careful as well, because there's that thing of, you can drown yourself, uh, by having too much water. Yeah. Mm. So it's just getting that balance right of not having too much and filling yourself up. Mm. Um, well, yeah, it's that balance right of, uh, not, uh, dehydrating and, uh, you know, be becoming like a, a desert jellyfish, like a little crisp. And drowning yourself. Yeah. You're right, it is a balance. That's exactly what you've got to I do. I don't know how you've managed it, Carl. It's very complicated. Yeah. No, but I... What I do is I, um, when I'm thirsty, I drink, and when I'm not thirsty, I don't. Yeah, but the, that's the problem with me. Uh, th whatever it is that's in your head that says you should have a drink, I don't really have one. <laughs> <laughs> it's called a brain. It's called a brain. Yeah. It's the brain that tells you. <laughs> but the brain's never thirsty. I only think of drinking when I'm eating. And I'm not eating as much because my kidney's weird. <laughs> I don't want to put any pressure on it, so I don't drink. So now, if I have it in front of me all the time, I go, right, I've got to have that. <laughs> so yeah, so I feel, you know, feel a bit better. Good. Just, uh, it's just been a long week. Because when you, when you don't do much, it's just, you know, time doesn't whiz by. And normally your weeks are packed, as we know, with visits yeah. to the cobblers. Yeah. And... Well, it's just, like they say, innit, they say, uh, 
following following an ant. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You know, we've got hectic schedule. I know. But, I don't know how you fit it all in. But you know, because I was close to death and everything. <laughs> you weren't close to death. I, I've been thinking about uh, you know other people who've been in that situation where they're dying and what have you, and it's weird how like, in a way, do you know like they say before you die things to do. Yeah. I I, think I've it's never best. heard that sentence before. I don't know if they say. Well, I've extrapolated from that. What you mean is there are certain things you should do before you die. Swim with dolphins, etc. Yeah. But in a way, because I've had such a boring week, it's been a long week. So if I was dying, don't go swimming with dolphins because you'll love it and the time will whiz by and you go, oh, there's another day gone. Whereas I've been sat at home watching, you know, The Price is Right and stuff. And it's just like, oh, it's only four o'clock. <laughs> oh, this is dragging. So if I was dying, I'd go, yeah, it's dragging, but I've got ages more left to live. Yeah, what's the point? But it's really about quality of existence, isn't it, when you're dying? No, but anyway, I'm just saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> been a boring week. But what I've been doing is going on the internet, oh, sort of learning stuff, of been watching more documentaries about stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay, tell me something you watched on the internet then. Uh, the thing that stands out the most uh, there's this spider. Right. That a fella got. Um, popped it in like a little sort of bottle. Yeah. And uh, chucked in 80 ants. And the spider, right, just went mental. And uh, I don't know if the spiders eat ants. I don't know. I don't know if they do. Uh, but uh, he wasn't happy with them that they were there. And he was just whizzing around, um, sort of biting them. Not eating them, just giving them a bite. And the ants would sort of just lie there, dead. <clears throat> and uh, spider had this system of sort of going, right, I'm going to put the dead ones over there. And it was biting them, dragging them across putting them in a pile, killing another one, popping it in the pile, and by the end of it, it made like a little pile of dead ants, and he was just there sort of breathing heavily. And that, that, that was amazing, because I've never witnessed that before. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't see that happening, do you, normally? So you think that if people are unfortunately passing away, instead of visiting Disneyland or whatever, they should... they should Just learn stuff, just sure, get on the internet and this, watch spiders this world is amazing. attacking ants. Um... And just that thing of, you know, you, last week you were saying how good ants were and how they brainy and they work hard and everything, yet none of them sort of, they didn't know what they were doing. There was panic going on. <laughs> <laughs> you watched them again, they were running backwards and forwards. And I've, I remember, like, seeing a programme about ants where um, they meant to sort of work together as a team. Yeah. And if they climb up a person's leg... Um, that person stood on their house, say, yeah. and they're all like, oh. There's uh, a signal and they all bite at the they same time. They all bite time. once. Now, yeah. if that had done that on that spider, yeah. they sort of all go on it, and when they're all in position, one of them sort of goes, no, and it bites, mm. and then it would it would do some damage, but there was none of that. Mm. And But you've seen things like the Towering Inferno, where even humans panic crazily and jump out of windows and things until Steve McQueen comes along and saves the day, so... Yeah, but... You, at the end of the day, when you're in a towering inferno, you were there relaxing on holiday. So, of course you're going to be relaxed, and it's, the shock of it's going to make you go, oh, I wasn't ready for that, I was sat here in my trunks. <laughs> whereas, <laughs> sure. whereas that ant, ants should always be alert. Well, yeah. Any insect's life should always be... Well, so for a human scooping up uh, 80 of them and putting them in a bottle with a giant spider. Yeah, but I'm just saying that's what insects do. Um, their life, they never relax. That's what's weird with an insect. There's no f downtime, is there? <laughs> it's you wake up, you go and get the food, you build your house. That's what you do, so you're always alert. They shouldn't be sort of running around going, oh, what do we do now? That should be, that should be in them. I love that you're that. annoyed at these poor yeah. ants that were bitten to death. But also, they say they're clever. I was looking at it. If I was an ant, I would have just crawled under the pile of dead ones. <laughs> just sit under there, wait for the spiders to go. None of them were doing that. They were all staying on one side and the dead ones on the other. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying that you know you're always sticking up for insects, saying they know what they're doing. They don't. Uh, uh, what, what do you mean? Well, where, where, <laughs> yeah. Where's this come from? When have I ever stuck up for insects? It's you that's follow them and say, saying they're brilliant and that, and ladybirds are right-handed and Christ knows what. No, but you know, so I'd learnt that. Brilliant. Um, you haven't learnt anything. Le there's nothing to learn from there's that. There's nothing is there? you learnt from uh, that. Uh, something about um, jellyfish uh, and uh, what else was there? There was this fella, there was a programme on the telly about survival. Um, and a fella who, uh, he, he looks after elephants. 
and he's in this little hang glider looking for an elephant that he's looking after. He has to keep a track on where it's going and all that. And one day he's saying, oh, I haven't seen the elephant today, and the fellow's like, look, look for it tomorrow. He's like, no, it's best if I go and look for it now, because it might go further away or something. He said, oh, I wish you'd leave it, you know, till tomorrow. So straight away you're going, oh, this is trouble. So he's going out in his glider, sort of at night. Uh, he's looking I for doubt the it's a glider. I imagine well, like it's, a, it's a glider with an engine. It's one a of light little. aircraft then. Yeah. So he, he gets in that on his own. He's wandering about in the air, looking down. Um, like I say, it's loads of land. He's looking for one elephant. He's not having much luck. Anyway, I think he gets to a point when he goes, oh, I'm having no luck, I might as well go home. Goes to turn round. Something happens. The glider falls to the floor, crashes. Light, light aircraft. Light aircraft yeah. yeah. That crashes. He gets out. He's broke his legs. Blind. Um Done his back in. Um, hurt his hands. I mean, he's in a bad way, and uh, he looks at the plane, and that's uh, that's a wreck. Petrol's coming out of it. He's thinking that's not going to fly again, and uh, he has to lie there, doesn't he, for like forty-eight hours or something. And in that time, everything's being chucked at him. He has a, a lion wandering around him. A scorpion walked over his leg. <laughs> Some sort of dangerous snake went in his shoe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else is there out there? Some sort of bad ants. Um, just everything that's there that could cause a problem. Mm. He had it all in his life. I, I, uh, I, I haven't seen this, but I suspect there's a lot of conjecture <laughs> yeah. in this telling of the it. Bad ants. Mean? Bad ants. No, just anything that you could think of mm. that's out there to cause you a bit of a problem. Camels. He got hot. He got so hot his lips fell off. <laughs> 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 no, because you have to have a lot of juice to keep your lips sort of how they are. Right. Uh, so that's the sort of state he was in. Yeah. 48 hours. And yet he survived in the end. Someone came and found him. And, and you that, thought that you were bored him. doing nothing? Yeah, no, well, He didn't even have the internet. Yeah, but he had a lot of insects. What would to you watch. do then if you, land, if you landed, right? Supposing uh, we all land, right? We're shipwrecked, okay? There's no food around. Um, but there's a chance we might be saved, like, in a few days. We've just got to stay alive just for a few days, okay? Mm. Um. Steve offers up his penis. For what purpose? Well, it's it's already you've torn it in the car in the uh, plane crash. Anyway, it's hanging off. You go, okay, listen, look, lads, let's eat this. Let's go. This will go three ways. I should be so lucky. <laughs> okay, fine, yeah. Uh, I'll look for something else. Because <laughs> we're surrounded by water. Why are we eating knob? There's loads of fish and everything. There's more fish in the sea than there is stuff on land. <gasps> that that was something else that I've read about about how there's more sea life happening. There's loads more. What stuff. do you mean? Than what? Um, than stuff happening on land. Well, yeah, it's a bigger place, isn't it? Yeah, and there's more, they're all coming further in because it's getting so crowded, everything's uh, being pushed outwards, so we, we're going to get to a point where people won't go walking in the sea, because there'll be something deadly just floating about on the on near the shore. Again, that's no information at all. <laughs> I don't know, There's yeah. no information in that statement at all. Yeah, I said, I said how the sea is so overcrowded that everything's being pushed to the edge. It's not overcrowded. It is. What's been? You mean things that are in the sea are being pushed to the edge of the yeah, sea? Yeah, because there's new stuff happening all the time. There's new creatures being made. They're changing quickly. They were saying how, like, I don't know, fifty years ago, jellyfish didn't even have a have a sting. That's rubbish. Try fifty million, and you'll get closer to the truth. But but what I mean is, in terms of like land, we all look the same, don't we? We've had two legs and two arms for ages. Whereas in the sea, things are changing at a, a really fast rate. So, like, jellyfish we're knocking about. The sea is a much more stable environment than the land, anyway. What are you on about? Well, I'd have thought... I wouldn't have thought evolution is any any faster in the sea than land. Yeah, it is. Well, no, what, what's, where's the evidence for this? The well, I'm telling you now. I'm telling you how jellyfish have changed. And look at them. They're and how have they changed, then? So, they didn't, 50 years ago, they didn't have a sting. Yeah. Now they have. Yeah. Trilbies, they wore trilbies 50 years ago as <laughs> yeah. well. And they just spoke with a much more, you know, <laughs> yeah, refined accent. Yeah. 
<laughs> just that that is quite a lot though isn't it because jellyfish are nothing but like no you've made that before. up that's not a fact there's, there, there's no facts come out of this that's not not oh that's interesting that you haven't said anything jellyfish oh. are, haven't changed in 50 years no they have they've changed a, a lot in terms of well they haven't changed in hundreds of millions of years so i don't know what the 60s had to do with anything i don't i, I just don't know what what influenced the Beatles and Mary Kwan at, suddenly had on jellyfish? Well, they because hadn't changed for was, hundreds of millions this, of years. The, with all this sort of loose, free sex, you know, free love, <laughs> yeah, they yeah. were just going berserk. I know, yeah. There were no inhibitions yeah. amongst the jellyfish anymore. Things are, are changing a lot. To think that jellyfish, when they, were, when they first came out, they were nothing. Jellyfish are, are nothing, aren't they? They're just a blob. <laughs> so when they first came out, when they were first released, and, new and, by Ronkel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what I'm saying is, even though they were nothing, they've grown to have a bit of something, <laughs> just to get by in a busy place. Which I is don't the know sea. what you're talking about. It's, it's all guesswork uh, and conjecture. It's not guesswork. I've been it's all nonsense. Week. I've been reading all this and watching stuff. Carl, you haven't learned anything. Mm. Well, that's not entirely true because he's obviously. Learned enough to have written a poem about some of these subjects. Oh, I love his poems. Are you getting into poetry now, properly? I really like it, yeah. Um, is Carl gonna read this for me, Steve? If you want him to. I think so. I did one about my kidneys. What was it called? Uh, didn't have a name, it doesn't need it. Ode uh, to a Nephron. Right, I did two about jellyfish. Excellent. Uh, I don't like jellyfish. They're not a fish, they're just a blob. They don't have eyes, fins or scales like a cod. They float about blind, stinging people in the seas, and no one eats jellyfish with chips and mushy peas. <laughs> Get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's just a short one I did about a jellyfish. Um, it would be spiteful to put jellyfish in a trifle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it certainly would. <laughs> so. That's really good, because it's jelly. He's 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 done us there, yeah, Steve. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, a yeah. really good poem. It would be spiteful to put jellyfish in a trifle. Yeah. A little yeah. half rhyme. Yeah. Um, do you want the one about my kidneys? Yeah. Uh, for God's sake, my belly ache. The doctor said it's my kidney. He said he's got a stick of tube up my knob. I said you got to be kidding me. <laughs> For God's sake, knob ache. <laughs> oh, oh uh, God! I'm sort of mildly disappointed that they're quite good. Yeah, yeah. No poet's ever written about jellyfish and kidneys. It's great! Oh God, I think you might have the market sewn up there. <laughs> it is. It would be spiteful to put a jellyfish in a trifle. I mean, I'm, I'm both impressed and fascinated and worried by Carl's new literary outlook. Yeah. You know, we, we've said to him, we've we've tried to make him appreciate the arts and poetry and and uh, you know, uh, you know, explaining like what metaphor does and and symbolism and all that. But I'm worried it will backfire because what if he becomes clever and erudite and then we lose? Our little endless well of stupidity. What if mm. we lose our little shaved monkey? I mean, these podcasts without, you know, it's almost like you were evolving into a human. I mean, you've actually you've authored a book. Well, I have to say, I mean, without at the risk of sounding like we're shamelessly promoting it, I've only just looked at the book today because that's the first time I've seen it, The World of Carl Pilkington, and uh, I was very impressed by how legitimate it feels. I mean, it does feel like an actual well, book. Well, he's put so much work into it. I it mean, he. He's no, done it's... drawings, he's done extra thoughts and ideas, and it's very odd to think that that has probably gone now into the British Library, which I think is obligated to take a copy of every book published. Incredible. I but, mean, let's be honest, it's not going to really, it's not going to be on anyone's bookshelf, it'll be on their lavatory cistern, possibly next to their bed. But nevertheless, you know, it's hardback and it's got pages, it's a real book. Yeah. Will you, uh, now read some, some great works? Will you read poetry at all, or...? Um. Probably not. A bit, I don't like reading made-up stories because Fiction. life's life's interesting enough, isn't it? Right. If I'm going to read someone else's lies, I might as well make some of my own up and save me money. Is what right. I mean. But you do read um, lies and made-up things. You just take them as the truth. 
Um, Most of the spurious facts and apocryphal tales and ridiculous stories that you read on the internet are, I mean, fiction. Yeah, but as long as it gets you thinking, then it really doesn't matter. Say, like, you know, I was telling you about the sea being full up. Yeah. Right? How there's too many fish in it and they're all being pushed out. Then, um, you know, it was saying about how the jellyfish is changing. Yeah. From a bit back just being a blob to now being a blob with stingy bits, you go, oh. and then no, I don't. I think I wonder what he read. And I then, wonder what he was reading. Then, then I'll think of what other things are in the sea. How are they changing? And then that's when I might do a poem about an octopus with two heads, <laughs> because it's it's got me thinking. So no longer am I just reading someone else's story, spending a full week reading some other story. I've read a little paragraph. And that's got me thinking about. And it's an inspired octopus you to make great art with uh, an octopus with two heads, and you just think, yeah, that would work. You know, that's a good good way for them to evolve. They've got all the arms. Give them two heads. <laughs> <laughs> They've got all the arms. And you know, it would work because, like I've said to you before, it is one big head to make it two smaller heads. So it's just looking at science, looking at how things can move. It's on. not looking at but science. But it's not looking at science. You then speculating on an, on an octopus having two heads is of no value, is it, to anyone or anything? But there's people out there who are bringing out books who are writing stuff like that for sci-fi stuff. And I think, why am I reading But that's entertainment. Head? Everyone knows it's not true. They're doing it to... But they do more than just say, what would it... Wouldn't it be great if there was, a, if there was an octopus with two heads? They then paint a world in which this octopus exists I and presumably causes some kind of narrative interest. I can do that on my own, though, without... So know, what's the story of the octopus with two heads? It's happier in the end. Everyone likes happy ending. He's got company. But if that's we not a story, Carl. What? what? Th Tell us the story. What, you made up a story about an octopus with two heads? No, I'm just saying... I've, I've pitched... I've thought about how the sea's changing. Right. right, what else is in the sea? Octopus. Right. What's an octopus like? Well, it's just a big head with a load of arms. Right. How would I change that? <laughs> <laughs> I love this thought process. But it's not a story. This is not a story. It's not anything. It's just some thoughts you've had. It's not- but a you're story- a story is there to make you think and, and have thoughts. But what is it that you've thought? You've not- I don't see what- what you've thought here. I've just thought, yeah, that'd be alright. <laughs> I know, but- well, like, like King Kong, then. That's only someone who's gone, oh, monkeys are getting better at stuff. Yes, but it has a story, doesn't it? They go in search- No, it isn't. It isn't saying monkeys are getting better at stuff. <laughs> that's not what it's saying. There's lots of themes, but that's not one of them. Monkeys anyway. are getting better at stuff. No, they're getting <laughs> yeah. better at stuff, the way they try to sort of- he tried to go out with a woman. <laughs> that's them moving on, isn't it? It's the monkey going, do you know what? I quite fancy her. And you know from the beginning, I mean, that is a story that you go, well, that relationship ain't gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I don't, I, I mean, I've not gone out with women who have f quite fancied, but then they smoke, and you go, oh, that's enough to put me off. Yeah. So, when a monkey's that big, I wouldn't even, the thought wouldn't even pass my mind. <laughs> to go on a date. we could, this could work out. <laughs> Sometimes it's just, you know, relationships are hate for each other. <laughs> now, that for a story, you, you you wouldn't think it'd go past page one, <laughs> yet you're having a go at me because an octopus has got two heads, which isn't that weird. When you look at them anyway, th I mean, it must be the weirdest <laughs> thing knocking about on the planet. I'm not kidding you. I've never seen anything so weird. And yet... <laughs> he's angry because he's not seen anything so weird as an octopus. So but it's it not yet a story. What's weird about it? What's strange about an octopus with all the things that could... Why is it any weirder than a dog? Because it couldn't be further away from us. A dog has got human eyes. <laughs> <laughs> if, if a jelly- honestly, if a jellyfish had a pair of eyes like ours, I probably wouldn't worry about him that much. But like I said to you, it's that way that <laughs> they haven't got eyes, they're floating about. I can handle some fish, they look- they look like us, they've got eyes, you can make eye-to-eye -eye contact with them. <laughs> what do you a jellyfish, what are you looking at? It's a snidey thing, like I've said to you. <laughs> You can see see a lot in eyes. Do you know what I mean? They say, don't trust him. Why? It's his eyes. Jellyfish haven't even got any and I don't trust them. <laughs> you, whereas if it had them, maybe they'd be the odd one that I'd go, oh, that one's all right. Okay, Carl, I'm just gonna throw an animal at you. Tell me how weird it is, what bits annoy you, how you'd change it. 
Okay. A crab. I would have changed it. Yeah. Does it annoy you? Do you think it's weird? Um, they are weird. But they're at that size where they can get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it suits them. Okay, um, good. Would it, would it change anything? Um, in a way, you know, what you're saying about things not working, he can't walk forwards. So but, why hasn't something happened? Why haven't they said, you know what, these arms are too clumsy. We need to have them so they can slot away easier and we can pull them out when we need them. <laughs> and so they're clumping around with them. Because they do struggle. You see them struggling with their arms. Yet they're still here. They're still doing that. They're still designed that way. What's the weirdest animal? So you think the octopus is the weirdest animal on earth? Yeah. In terms of um, design and everything, and uh, if you lined everything up, Say if I'd come from another planet yeah. and everything was lined up in a row and they said, right, we're going to give you a crash course in what's knocking about on this planet. Yeah. And you go, right, go on then. And you go, this is man, here's a woman, here's a dog, here's a cat, mm. here's an octopus, here's a... I go, hang on a minute, what is this? Oh, he's only going really down and out! That jingle, of course, signifies another reading from Carl Pilkington's diary. There was an animal in the paper today that I've never before seen. Jesus it's called an alpaca. They are gormless looking. The fellow who breeds them said they are easy to look after because they're used to harsh conditions because they normally live in the mountains. The problem with this is they will turn useless eventually and then if we tried to bung it back on the Andes, they won't like it. It's like how people win these live like a star for a week competitions. They're not good for anyone. Okay. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> if something's living somewhere, but, he's not but why are we going to bug it back? Andes. He's presumably breeding them for something else. Yeah, but say if eventually, you know, the world's getting busy, there's hardly any room, and we go right. What can we shift here? What's getting in our way that we can shift? Well, those funny-looking things came from the Andes. Bung them back. All right, then let's put them back. And they go. Oh, they don't like it. They're not surviving. They're dying out. Why did we bring them here? Oh, it was closer. Yeah, but look, we've died out now of the. Sorry, this is not this, this yourself. Is a whole scenario. No, this, this isn't happening. Don't get angry about it. Like it just happened, and you're sick of it. None of this has happened no, yet. I'm just looking at how it will happen. <laughs> Leave them where they were. But it's you're like... you're getting angry about things that you're speculating on now. It's absurd, Carl. Not once have that I read here about your anger yourself. about about terrorism or international, you know, political injustice. Not once have you written about that. <laughs> Only about the fact we may send animals back to the Andes. I know, but just because it, it just annoyed me, that's all. They brought them here. Some fellas getting a load of praise because they brought this weird animal into the country, and yet it's like, well, they were they were on the Andes for a reason. Leave them there. It was happier there. I, I mean, I feel guilty when I open a bag and a fly flies out of it, and I think, where's that come from? What bag are you opening with bat flies? What bag? No, just when, like, you know, the bag I took the computer home in, a fly flew out of it, and I thought, when did that get in that bag? Where have I brought that from? And it's the same thing. It doesn't want to be somewhere else. It was where it was. And that's the same with this Palaco, or whatever. <laughs> It's amazing! It really is the ramblings of a madman, isn't it? Some new sea thing has been found. <laughs> <laughs> There's no headlines on the news! <laughs> it wasn't found by sea experts, it was found on eBay. Someone was selling it for a fiver. I don't see the point in buying something that you don't know what it is. What do you I mean? What do you mean? It was- it was- Someone's found some sort of shell with a thing living in it. Right. Um, they thought, oh, I've never seen one of these before, I can flog it on eBay. Someone bought it and then wanted to look after it, went to some sea expert and they said, oh, I don't know what that is. That's, that's, that's the story. It's just weird how stuff's being found on eBay. No, it wasn't found on eBay though, was it? Yeah, but that's where the specialist people sort of picked up on it. It's just weird that, I mean, I, all, all I was saying is I wouldn't want one. If you don't know how to, if it's a new creature, you don't know what, what makes it happy. <laughs> when you get a kitten, you go, stroke its head, loves it, right? And you can do that knowing that it's liking it. <laughs> if I had a little seashell and you go, does it sit in water? I don't know. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You could end up doing more damage. So that's why I wouldn't want it. It's nice to have rules, isn't it? It's nice to know what you're doing with something. 
Well, as you write in the diary, it's like if an alien landed and wanted to live oh, with you. <laughs> as much fun as it might sound, it wouldn't be long before you got annoyed with it because it wouldn't eat the food you gave it. That's what I'm saying, but I couldn't have a go at it because it might not like pasta. <laughs> <laughs> it might not. <laughs> Everyone likes pasta. Well, that's it for another week. I hope you've enjoyed this half hour of drivel. I mean some of the most stupid things ever said. I mean, it's like, he's got a contempt now for the world. Like, yeah. he doesn't care what comes out of his head. Learning can be frustrating. <laughs> Can't it? You know, you, you maybe I'm getting you thinking, maybe on your way home today you'll be going, yeah, octopus with two heads. And, and if you do that for five seconds, I've done my job. Good to have a job, innit? So, uh, for me, Vicky Gervais, goodbye. From Steve Merchant. Goodbye. And from Carl Pilkington. Right. Hello and welcome to uh, number four in the series of six, season three of the Ricky Gervais Show with me, Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant. Hello. And Carl Pilkington. All right. Uh, yeah, first of all, I'm sorry to do this, but me and Steve have got to bring something up that's been bugging us for a couple of weeks now, but it's, it's reached... Uh, you are so fucking lazy, Carl, at the moment. You have time off... Right, you go away every weekend, so me and Steve are so precious with the, you know, so many things to do, with extras and books coming out and stuff. You, we, I, I've never heard anyone whinge about going in with kidney stones. Don't I know whinge. loads of people that had kidney stones. Not like They've mine. had the, yeah, yeah, no, 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 you say not like that because uh, they have. They've had the operation. I know people that had their appendix out, right, an actual under the knife operation, yeah. and he was back at work the next day, and he had a bit of a. A sore side. But you have whinged now for weeks and weeks. Everything you say, oh, I've had this, uh, oh, I've got to go in again. But you're still well enough to go away every weekend to see your folks or your in-laws. Yeah, well, this is the or, problem. This or a is... holiday. And, 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 and it's just, we are so, you know, sometimes you've got to pull together, mate. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, you say keep a diary. Mm. And you said make sure you do a diary for a year. Yeah. If I didn't go and visit people and travel the world, what would I do in it? Carl, yeah. I read your diary every week. All you seem to do is spend time in a cafe, having a cup of tea and a bit of breakfast. That's the who weekend, are you, that's who are you constantly visiting? Anyway, let's not argue. You don't People even don't like your family, I thought. It's not my family, is it? Well, you Suzanne's don't, family. You don't but like anyone, work, why are you visiting But you me? say, I'm working that weekend. I'm working that weekend. We have to put, say, right, work, let's put this in first, no, you know, no, it's a busy fam time. Family's important, and yeah. you can't keep messing people around. But this about. is all you have to do. No, what no, else are you doing? doing? What is other it, job have you got? Those you know. stuff, I don't want to go into what I'm doing, but I've got loads but of stuff. But all I hear is you're well, always having meetings. I know, always yeah. going from meetings. Yeah, I know, yeah, 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 I don't know what that means, meetings. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, no, seriously though, so, you've been on your travels, you've got, you know, you've got lots to talk about, so... Yeah, I've got to go know. in hospital again as well, haven't I, so... What's your current state with your old... Oh, well, I don't want to go on about it. Well, no, I, I mean, you're, you know, you've brought it up. It's you're fine, you're well enough to go away, you're well enough to go on holiday, you're well enough to visit people, you went on a train, you went to Manchester, you must be well enough, so you're well enough to do this. I went back to, uh, Bristol at the weekend, I had a bit of time off, as nice. you know, because Carl couldn't do the work. So I know, that's, that's what I mean, yeah. so we all had a nice pop. No, well, no, I didn't. I, I, I went to Bristol when I was working. Oh, that's all right. But well, exactly. he's still visiting a place, is what I'm saying. Well, well, that's a ridiculous thing to say. That's like saying a pilot doesn't work, because he's visiting a place. No, because he doesn't visit it. He no, doesn't you sit down plane. on your ass. Sometimes you hire a car, so you can't be reading or, or studying. You're driving for six hours. Yeah. I, I went there working. We went to America, we were working. I went to Bristol, I was working. Oh, shut up. Ooh. Do you know what I mean? Getting a bit uppity. The truth hurts, Stephen. <laughs> the truth does hurt, and it's interesting yeah. that he suddenly snapped at you there. I because know. Because I wondered to myself, if it weren't for you, Mr. Ricky Gervais, what would this man, this little round-headed man, be doing right now? Fuck all, Stephen. Fuck all. Yeah, I went back to Bristol at the weekend, and I'd, as we know, we all had a bit of time off. And, um, uh, actually I was quite annoyed because I, uh, I passed the pub near where my parents live, and they had a band on. You know, pubs sometimes have a band on. And the name of the band, I'm disappointed that I missed them, the name of the band, Rick, was <laughs> Loose Change. <laughs> but what I like about Loose Change is it's the least evocative name for a band, isn't it? It's, it's not amazing. sexy, it's nothing. It's got no kind of mood or feel to it at all. Loose, Loose Change. change. It's, it's just, it's... Uh, welcome. Rough outline. <laughs> yeah. It, it's just nothing. The checkbook stubs. <laughs> <laughs> Pocket fluff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but while I was at my parents' house, they, they often, uh, you know, they keep clippings of things, you know, if, if we've been mentioned in the papers, they like to keep a record of them and stuff, because, uh, I like to show it to my grandparents, you know, and keep, a, you know, keep, keep fully abreast of things. And, uh, they, I... D 
you know, I managed to find a couple of them. This was what, I don't know if you've heard this, Carl. It's, for people who don't realise, Carl was making a couple of little three-minute TV projects recently that were on Channel 4. And in the Sunday Times, they, uh, someone's written a letter about Carl to the Sunday Times. Wow. Uh, they can send in comments and views on things they've seen, read, heard. Oh, excellent. And this is what they, someone wrote to the uh, Sunday Times. Oh. Who is Carl Pilkington? <laughs> And why have I just wasted five minutes of my life listening to some of his cretinous thoughts on Channel 4? <laughs> he asked, why are there so many dinosaurs on display in museums? Quotes, couldn't they just choose the best one and just show that? He summed it all up by deciding that we know too much. Somebody clearly doesn't know enough to know that this is a complete waste of airtime showing no wit, intellect or creativity. That's from Wendy Robinson in Berkshire. You can't have your critics. Do you know what I mean? You've got to have your critics. Of course you have. If everybody liked what you did, then you're not doing the right thing. <laughs> you wasted five minutes and they were three minute wonders, so it must have felt yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> two thirds as long again. But think how an angry she must have been to have bothered writing this letter to the Sunday yeah. Times. Well, that's good. I mean, though. you it's really must have. It's all about getting people thinking. That's what I always say to you. <laughs> as long as I'm getting people thinking about what I've said, she remembered what I said. But what, what views did you put out in these short films which you feel people perhaps should be talking about, discussing, digesting, thinking about? Uh, just stuff that was in my head that day when I was filming them. Yeah. Is it in your head now? Uh, some of it is. <laughs> I re now you've remembered me what I said. Now you've what? Now you've sort of told me what I said in that one. Yeah, I remember saying that. Yeah. And I, st and I stick by it. Remember him some other stuff? Yeah. I'll tell you now, right? This, uh, yeah, if, I don't know if Wendy's, you know, listened to this. But, Almost certainly not. But listen, right? <laughs> I was saying about the the uh, museums, right, and how they're big and everything, and they've Brilliant. got dinosaurs all over the shop. I read right. mm. that in the, in that museum, they've got something like uh, seven million bits of stuff in there, <laughs> right? Now, when I spend two hours in somewhere, just show me the good stuff. Don't be saying we've got seven million bits. Because there was a fella, who, a fella who opened it, right, I did a bit of research on the museum. Fella who opened the museum up, uh... Well, what was his name? It doesn't matter. Okay. Doesn't matter, does it? What museum was it? It was the London one. Oh, the London one, yeah, okay. So, he's in there, and he's, he's collecting all this, you know, bits of stuff. What stuff? Just whatever's knocking about at that oh, time. Right, okay. it, just, it seemed like... You have researched it. He <laughs> never chucked anything away. He's oh, like, right. oh, I won't put it in the bin, pop it on a shelf. Okay, right? so yeah. So, he's put everything on a shelf oh, in right, the museum. Yeah. Then, as time oh, I think you're on, going into too much detail, but just give us the gist of it. No, but all I'm saying is, uh, it keeps everything, and if you keep everything, sometimes it'll be good stuff, right? Um, and a lot of the stuff was going missing, the good stuff. But people who set these museums up are just as crafty. <laughs> what? The fellow who found Tutankhamen, he was pocketing all sorts of fingers and stuff in his pockets on the way out. <laughs> That had rings on them and stuff. So all I'm saying is, why is she having a go? But she's hang on, wait, no, I, what's that got to do with someone pocket? I don't understand your because, point. Because she's sort of moaning at me, going, "Don't have a go at the museum and the dinosaurs." But no, she, but she's having a go at your idiot. fatuous you're, point. Yeah, you're absolutely uneducated, but, stupid I mean, I, point I, that I, you got. You got TV time to talk absolute shit. If I could uh, that's not paraphrase my fault, Wendy, is it? that's not my fault. If someone says they want me to do a little program and you can do what I want, I went and did what I did. But, free speech, But it? we just gave you the chance then to defend yourself and you just confirmed Wendy's point a thousand times over. What was all this waffle about people nicking stuff? What's that got to do with anything? Because she's having a go at me, I didn't nick but anything. But she's having a go at you for talking uh, uh, nonsense uh, that's of no consequence, which is what you just did I then. Talk nonsense. But what was your point? Oh, Alright then, well we'll watch Wendy's little programme when that goes out. Let's <laughs> see what she's got to talk about. Sick of her. So anyway, as I say, my mother saves various clippings and things which may be of interest. This was recently in the uh, Daily Mail, in one of those kind of uh, gossip columns. Uh, Ricky Gervais's cringe-worthy dance routine as managerial buffoon David Brent was undoubtedly the highlight of BBC comedy The Office. Perhaps credit for the scene should not go to Gervais, however, but his lanky co-writer Stephen Merchant. <laughs> for I hear that six foot seven inch Merchant has been attracting a great deal of female attention at the so-and-so pub in North London. Uh, until he took to the dance floor with Brent-esque results. Says my mole, most of the feminine throng looked away in embarrassment. 
Putting it kindly, he was rather ungainly, like a giant albatross hopping on stilts. <laughs> right, now then. I'll take issue with this because, firstly, you wouldn't be attracting female attention in the first place. Rick, if I had been, I'd have phoned the mail myself. <laughs> Point A, right? I seem to remember distinctly. I was talking to one of my mates the whole night, and we were discussing about the fact we were too shy to talk to girls. <laughs> so wrong there. Yeah. Point two, as you well know, if I take to the dance floor, which on this occasion I didn't, I remember distinctly not because I love to dance. I would not have been described as a giant albatross hopping on stilts because Carl has seen me dance, you've seen me dance, you know I'm a good mover. Yeah. I, just in the same way that people can't quite understand how Peter Crouch, the same height as me, yeah. is able to be so brilliant on the football field. Yeah. The same people look at me when I'm dancing, they go, I don't know how that big guy is able to bust some of those kind of moves. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've yeah. won two dance contests in my life. Those, yeah. those facts, those stats speak for themselves, Rick. I know, I know. I mean, you've seen me dancing, how would you describe me? It, uh, I, I, I think that you look like a, isn't an albatross, isn't so? You look like, um, an upright lizard, right, give, having being given electroshock treatment, and I think that's a lot fairer, isn't it, than the albatross nonsense? Well, I, mm, so I'm just trying to picture that because again, I, I, was that a compliment? You were on my side, right? You were defending yeah, me. Yeah, a cross between a giant lizard and a a, a, a stick insect. Again, because they don't sound in, 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 straight away. They don't sound like compliments, but I'm assuming oh, you're on okay. my side here. Uh, stick insect with funny glasses. Is that For my, again? I, yeah. I just, I thought, mm, I was thinking you were perhaps being a bit touch more supportive, but these, you've not really, Carl, you've seen me dance, what, what, what are your views? Uh, it's just like a bit of weird art. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant! That is brilliant! That's so much better than Albatross! <laughs> I wouldn't have said an Albatross, because I was looking at one of them the other day, and I don't understand what they mean by that, because they're dying out. They say, you know, uh, <laughs> They dive in the sea. Oh, it's gone. Yeah. Something happened in the brain. It went from the point we were making, via an albatross, then it just shot off. It just ping, like a pinball. Well, let's hear because it it's going to be another good point. No, it's just saying how, um, because I've, I've never seen one and they were saying, how would you feel if, if you never saw one again? And I was like, you know, I've got by this long without it. <laughs> it's not bothered me. <laughs> but, um, but it was, point. it was just sort of saying, uh, <laughs> what they do is they dive in the sea sort of put their head under the water, see if there's any fish knocking about, grab one, get out again, right? Yeah. Go to land. I don't know if they're designed to do that. Well, obviously they are. No, because seagulls are, because you see them floating about. Now, what's happening is, they're doing that, but getting caught in nets. Well, that's it. The net shouldn't be there. That's the point. They're totally adapted to their environment, but we came along, millions and millions of years afterwards and stitched them up. It's not like people are going, well, the nets were always there. How did they evolve without getting caught in the net? We invented the net. We've only been knocking around for a few hundred thousand yeah, years. but what I'm saying is it's that thing about animals learn by mistakes by other animals. You know, like the monkeys, uh, peeling potatoes. Right. <laughs> That's never happened. They go and put nuts in the salt water to, to salt the nut. Whatever. How does that, how does that get to peeling potatoes? But, uh, because in your head, they were working in a canteen. Making chips. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, yeah! It yeah. doesn't matter what the food is, I'm just saying how they know how to, to sort of prepare I love food. the fact that you don't care what the fact is. When you're discussing facts, that's all that matters. Otherwise, on Mastermind, they just go, um, uh, who wrote Much Ado About Nothing? Dickens? Yeah, close enough, whatever, someone did. It, the fact is the what matters. Yeah, but with that question, that's got a straightforward answer. What I'm telling you is the way that animals work. If it's a potato or a nut, it's a foodage. <laughs> 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 and once again, I return you to my question as before. What's your point? What were you- what point were you making? I'm just saying an albatross will find f if you're hungry, you find food or you change your diet. If you don't <laughs> eat something else, you die out. Simple. Said before, if you want a pie, but they haven't got any pies, you have a pasty. Alter your diet. Mm. And an albatross- Drastically. <laughs> yeah. yeah oh, pies radical. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Completely changing my diet. No more pies. <laughs> what are you eating? Pasty. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna eat quiche anymore, I'm gonna have a tartlet. But you, you're getting more and more sort of single-minded in your- No, single-celled. Yeah. It's not, though. In your belief that everything you say 
has got some kind of profound implication and that, and that no one else is listening. That we're all ignorant. All right. We're all not it, listening to what you're saying. Here's another one. Go on. Here's something else to discuss. Oh, come on. This would be good. In series This would be as good as E equals MC squared. The, uh, the people aging backwards idea. Well, it's not an idea. They've done something on it, saying how- No, they haven't. A baby has been messing about with emails. <laughs> right? Right. Oh, yeah. God! A 65 year old doesn't know how to use email. So, again, my system works. Uh, so say if you're an old person, you're- you're not using the internet, but you shouldn't be anyway. Because you should be sort of just getting used to life as an old person. When you're a baby and you're about to die, they're using the internet. I don't know what you mean, when you're a baby and you're about to die. This is if, this it, is if this was your world, idea, if it was yeah. your world. Well, let me just ask a couple Sorry, of questions. Sorry, that makes no sense at all. What you just- uh, that makes no I'm sense at all. I'm just saying that my theory- You may as well have hit a walk. What to saying. express that point, because they're- yeah. I, The pong- yeah. That would have made more sense. <laughs> See, this is why, more profound. This is why- More when, resonant. This is why Wendy's having a go, though. Because you're not being open-minded. You're not thinking about- But we're being open-minded to good ideas, to sensible thought, to intellectual considerations. We're not being open-minded to this utter drivel. Yeah, but every invention is a bit- who, who'd have thought the frisbee would have caught on? <laughs> I don't think that can count as an invention, though. Of course it is. People are paying for it. Someone said, I'm gonna invent something But people are paying out. for carrots. But they're not an invention. Because you pay for something, it doesn't mean it's an invention. No, but a man-made thing. A frisbee, is, it didn't grow off a tree, did it? It's, someone's made that and gone, I can sell this. And people are buying it. <laughs> you know, all I'm saying is, things- things change, don't they? You know, the albatross is dying out. The way, uh like, when I walked into the flat, right, we've had hot weather, haven't we? We've had a lot of flies knocking about. Now, when I was younger, I never saw flies sort of hanging about in- in gangs. <laughs> Whereas- <laughs> I don't know what world this is! Would they have little motorbikes? No, you know, just- uh, you'd sort of see one, one would get in the house, you know, my dad would kill it or whatever, but you'd never see three, you wouldn't be going, oh, which one am I gonna get first and everything, they'd, they'd come in, they'd exit out of a window or whatever. Whereas I walked in on- on a bit of activity. <laughs> There's nothing to eat here. Right? <laughs> Three flies in the flat, right? All sort of whizzing around. Right. All together, right? So I just sort of think, oh, you know, let them be. Uh, they seem to be happy. Uh, you know, they- they're playing around with each other, right? Sat down, reading the paper, look up, right? It was like- there was, one was trying to like, have it away with- with one of the flies, and the other one was- was a having a go as well. It, it turned out it was a little fly that didn't want any of the action, but two were attacking it. How could you possibly gauge that? <laughs> Just by watching. That's how you learn, isn't it? You watch. You, you watch. But no, this is conjecture again. You had no idea what was going on there. No, I did. It's 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 the way they were sort of jumping on it and stuff, and I was like, oh, I'm not happy with this going on, and <laughs> you know, under my roof, sort of thing. <laughs> My um, house, my rules. But it's- but it's a nightmare because it's small, you can't control it, you don't know which one's which, you might end up sort of pushing out one that's the baddie- What are you and you're talking pushing out, about? I'm just saying- Why are you getting involved? Just because creatures are changing all the time. What are you talking about? What point are you making? I'm just saying, the way that flies used to be happy-go-lucky, <laughs> on their own, the sun's out, have a fly about. <laughs> Whereas yeah. nowadays, oh, now, there was like little attacks going on. <laughs> oh god! Oh god, I'm lying. But how could you tell which were the two aggressors and which oh. was the victim? How well, could this, you distinguish? This, this was this was the problem. I mean, all I was looking at was which one they kept attacking, and I was thinking if I can get that one in the bedroom and then get the Sorry. other two out the window. What are you d just breaking it up? Because <laughs> uh, what sort of a person would it be to let that go on? <laughs> He has no feelings for anything. He doesn't care if whole species die out. That's, Why are you getting involved? Wrong. That's where you're wrong. Because I think I think more than most people. I think there's a lot of people who just go through the motions. Yeah. They do it's the been... same thing every day. They can do a job, but that's all they stick to. They don't think about what them flies do. Carl, what's that? I've known doing? you for I don't know four years, and all you ever say is things like, "Why do we have jellyfish?" No, I, I mentioned a jellyfish today. But it's the same old shit. 
You look at someone, you make up your own story, and then your conclusion annoys you, even though it's totally fatuous. Like I say, the man with the frisbee. What happens if if he had a mate who said rubbish that he wouldn't have done it? <laughs> I love the fact that you think the frisbee is the pinnacle of invention. Yeah, I think it's amazing. No, it's an example of something that you know. If he was on some program where you you know you said I've invented this, did go get out. They wouldn't have. They wouldn't give him time of day to say right. I've made this thing. It's out of plastic. You throw it about. What what for? Well, you just took it about on the beach. What's the point? It was a bit of fun, innit? No, I don't like it. How okay, many and that was an argument with himself. <laughs> no, but do you know what I mean? It's a popular little thing and I'm just saying it's easy to put ideas down. But you've never even come up with an idea as good as the frisbee and that's saying something. I came up with a clippable mat that goes what? on a cup and it's a, it's a good little thing. I haven't followed it through yet. A what? A clippable mat. What's a clippable mat? What a does that mean? A clippable mat that you stick on a cup so you, you can put your cup down on a table without having to go, oh, where's that mat? It's, it's clipped to the cup all the time. And you put the cup down wherever you want because it's got a mat on it. I think I've seen that. But why does it have no, to be haven't. clipped to no, the Why couldn't it just be built into the cup? Because, uh So it clips onto, you've got to have special cups. It doesn't yeah. clip onto every cup. No, but just the same way that every sauce is different. You don't say, oh, I'm sick of this sauce. It doesn't fit a mug. You, you use the sauce of that cup. I mean, I don't use sauces. <laughs> just don't buy that sort of thing. But isn't a sauce of what you're talking about? Uh kind of, yeah, but it's clippable. But why is the clip of, why is the clippability so important to you? So you don't have to keep finding the, the, the mat when you put the cup down, it's constantly clipped to the mat. But the why cup. does it have to be clippable? Because that suggests it's removable. Why not just have something where it's constantly attached? What's to stop you from losing that in much the same way as you lose the coasters? Do which we cause need this, this? Do we need a well, clippable coaster? No, let's just let's ask him like it's the dragon's den. Let's okay, ask him yeah. now. What? We've got money to invest yeah. on your clippable right. cup. What's now pitch this idea to us. Tell it. How would you sell this well, idea you, to you us? You just said. Uh, what was your question then? Brilliant. So you're not listening. Let's start no, again. I am. Okay. I, I no, just, imagine you walked in. You've what just is walked it for? In. What is it for? Is it is it is it a coaster to stop uh, the heat from the cup burning the varnish? Rick, let him explain. Or let's is it a saucer to stop? Um, well, look at it. Let's it let's let's have you pitch this idea to us. Just you've you've never met us before. You were investors. Tell us, explain this to us. Sell it to us. Right. Um, we're living in a world uh, where furniture is important to people. They spend a lot of money on it, don't they? Furniture. Yeah, There's absolutely. so many furniture shops out there. Yeah. All different types of wood from all over the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Good if something's point. come from the Amazon, mm. you don't want a coffee stain on it. No, you don't know. Right. But we're living in a world as well mm. where people don't use saucers. What when you, when you go out, when you go out and buy, because people. What do you mean we live in a world where they don't use saucers? Yeah, there's loads of saucers. Yeah. Because I know people who buy cups singly. Right. Because there's only two people living in a flat, so you don't buy a big box. Because in a big box of of like plates and that, you get things like, uh, you know, s s uh, what's what's the plate that's above a saucer but below a plate? <laughs> <laughs> I never. I, <laughs> <laughs> the plate that's above a saucer, but below a plate. <laughs> so it's a plate, but it's below a plate. But it's a size that you sort of go, what am I doing with this? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what would it be? A, a side plate? Uh, maybe, but- A plate that you'd have alongside your regular dinner plate, right? Maybe. You put a bread roll on or something in a restaurant. Maybe, yeah, okay. But, but you What's your point? That. What do you no, think I'm just, it's fascinating to me. Cause what? this is his best attempt now to okay. try and attract investment. Do you know where the, your mats are at home? I haven't got mats, don't use them. Why not? Because uh, it, it doesn't bother me. I, I haven't got any highly polished um, uh, furniture from the Amazon. Right, Steve, have you got any sort of- I've got some coasters and I use the coasters. And do you know where they are when you need one? Well, yes, because they're always at the place where I would normally put down a mug of hot tea, i.e. Yeah. on a table or a coffee table. Right, now- I keep- if, if I had a, a highly polished table from the Amazon, I'd keep my coasters on it. Yeah, but what I'm saying now is- what happens if you get up with your cup of tea? You're a busy man, right? This yeah. is what I'm saying. We're living in a world where people are busier than yeah, ever. Yeah, go on, go on. Not everybody can sit down and enjoy a cup of tea sat in the same place. Right. You get up and you might move into another room. Um, we haven't got a, you haven't got a polished table in there from the Amazon, so doesn't No, matter. but you might be working on another expensive table. Oh, fine, we'll have a coaster there as well. That has a computer on. My question is this. One, does it fit all mugs? Uh, or do I have to buy a special mug to have this special well, bit we attached. Can, we can work it whatever way you want. We can either look at the standard size mug and say, let's appeal to everyone, or we can get in, in touch with some mug company. How is it clipped? Just like little plastic clips that clip onto it. Yeah. 
and then you clip it off and you and you clean it. The dishwasher proof, by the way. I, yeah, I think I don't, I, no, but, they don't need that. But at all. why? Why can't you just make a mug? that has something mm, built, built in, in the base of the mug to prevent it from making the mark. No, I don't it's only that. the heat that makes the mark, isn't it, really? I, I, I just want to say now, it's a pointless idea, um, and I'm out. Right, but what about the idea that you've just suggested then, with the mug, with the saucer built in? Yeah. What about, will we, will we do that together? But that's not, that's not your idea, that's my idea. Yeah, but without my idea, you wouldn't have had that. Well, but that's absurd. We're having a conversation. I've come up with an idea. Now I've got the money. You, I've want, got the money, and I'm going to go off with that idea. Yeah, you haven't painted it anyway, and it's a rubbish idea. And you could—it's not rubbish because I've just thought as well that would be good for putting biscuits on the side as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Okay, no, no, that stop. means we can get rid of that plate that R I don't know. By what the it way, is. now this is broadcast. You can never paint this idea because it's out in public domain. Rick, 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 why don't we see if there's anyone out there who's willing to invest in this idea? Are you a mug manufacturer? Are you a mug designer? Are you someone who's got any interest whatsoever in this idea? Do you think it's a saleable idea? And, more importantly, would it be not great to have a picture of Carl's face on the mat? Because it's perfectly round. Perfectly round. As well, and it, you'd scold him every time yeah. you, uh, yeah. So there'd be a certain satisfaction in that. Yeah, well if Peter Jones is listening, or that Valentine fella, or, uh, what's his name? Any uh, of the, uh, big uh, investors on that show, or indeed yeah. any investors anywhere podcast at rickygervais.com. Get in touch. Tell us how, how we can move forward with this brilliant new idea. Hmm? Pathetic. Oh, Chip has gone and written it down the little... Ah! <laughs> the jingle that signifies another reading from Carl Pilkington's diary. Got up and put the radio on. I listened to the story that the vicar read on Radio 2. Yeah, that could be good. He was saying how Jesus was 33 when he, when he died. He said he was more into the idea of doing a lot in your life than living for ages. This was linked to the news about the doctor who's come up with some stuff that he's been injecting himself and his wife with that makes you age better. I looked it up on the internet. It wasn't worth them doing it because they are already old looking. I don't know why people want to stay looking young. You can wear a bald head better if you're old because hairs are replaced by wrinkles. That's drivel. No, it's, it's not drivel. Pointless. It's just a pointless entry to a diary, that. It's not because that could be a, a, a like an important bit in like world history. What? The fact that that people that someone's trying to make people not age. Age is good, isn't it? When you see an old person, this been going forever. What has? People trying to age better. No, but he's talking about if you're ninety, he wants people to look like they're thirty, and that's not good because how, how would the world run when that's going on? Well, I agree. But you know, it's, when people, again, it's not a revelation. If I, if, if I like chatting to old people, because they know a lot of stuff. So if I'm sat on a train and someone's old, I'm happier talking to them about- They get up and move after about ten well, minutes. Well, no, he likes the they, fact that many of them are infirm and can. <laughs> yeah, they, they have to stay there and listen to this but, one. But yeah, even that, even that means that they're getting more out of life in a way, because they don't move about as much, so they have more thinking time. It is weird how that happens to you as you get closer to death. Jesus. You know, you're not working as much. Because you're resting and you can think back about your life and you can think, oh, I had a good one. Actually, it's not been that bad. Whereas if- But you must have started that now. Because you've been doing nothing for the past three months. Yeah, but I'm just, uh, well, like I'm saying, it is a good thing for you to do to sort of think about what you've been doing with your days and your weeks. And, and how stuff. do you assess your life so far? With all this spare time you've had in your hands and moping around and moaning about your illness and just sitting around, right? Uh, you've been uh, introspecting, have you? Yeah. Go on then. What have you come up with? I haven't come up with anything. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, I have, I have an all right life, and things are changing. Oh, keep saying that. No, but the, but you don't know how much they are changing to the point of I don't know if I mentioned the squirrel eating Mars bars, but from that, <laughs> from 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 that happening to monkeys opening bottles with lids on them, to it's just it's it's mental out there. It's madness what is going on. And all I'm saying is old people need to be old people. You need oldness. You need to see old people. You need to go, right, they might have a solution. They've been on the earth longer. Quick, we need an answer. How old are you? I'm 32. Well, you look 78. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying! I don't know who that conversation was with, why you got angry, and I think you made the opposite point that you were making yeah. at the beginning. If you say like you're 32, you look 78. No, you were saying about it would be a problem if you were 78 and looked 32. Well, I don't know what you're saying. You came down on the wrong side then. Either. You did that whole thing and you bollocksed it up again in your brain. I'm just saying, either way, you need to have people who look old. Otherwise, who's in charge? <laughs> <laughs> I 
you're doing what you mean. Right. So you say, even if, so you're saying it'd be all right to make 78 year olds look 32 as long as there were some 32 year olds that look 78, as long as you've got old looking people. No, but say Can like- Can I tear this page out? <laughs> what? Because it's worthless. <laughs> what I mean is, when I went to the doctors, oh. I saw the specialist. All right mm. about the kidney stones. I was I was asking him all the straight questions. Go on. Is it life threatening? No. Uh, you know how long am I going to be out? Couple all the rest of days. Of it, right now, he as was, it turned out, it is life threatening, and you've been out for three months whinging about the fucking thing. Strange. Now he was quite old. He looked about <sighs> fifty-five, and that reassured me in a way. In a way, it didn't because he's he, he's one of them doctors who didn't open his eyes much, and I kind of thought, I hope you. I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean? What? What do you mean he didn't open his eyes much? One of those sort of doctors who's either that overworked that he's, he, he does that, you know, when he's like, he's tired, so he's going, right, what we're going to do is, and he's doing that with his eyes shut, he's talking well, this like is, that. this is radio. I know, but I'm telling you, so you can see. But people are meant to be listening to this. But if they can't imagine me with my eyes shut. Well, tell them you got your eyes shut. Just right, say yeah. he had his eyes shut. Yeah, he had his eyes shut. Oh, had he been reading this? No. <laughs> Bored stupid, I imagine. He's just trying to get a... Oh. Do, do you know what I mean? I, or, or, I don't know if it's because he's tired or if he's that educated that some people know so much you don't even have to look at it. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about! Intelligent people! Who is so educated that they don't need to open their eyes? Well, you see it, you see <laughs> like... <laughs> what is that? Uh, who's that bloke up there? Is he blind? No, he's been reading too much. <laughs> He no. doesn't open his eyes anymore, doesn't no. he? No. Old, old people who you see wearing tweed and what have you and they're really posh and they talk and whenever they talk their eyes are shut and they I open don't it. know what this observation is. I don't understand why you've never seen that. I've never seen an old educated man wearing tweed who doesn't bother open his fucking eyes. Steve, I don't you? know what you're talking about. Well, Steve, have you seen- do you know what I mean when people don't sort of open their eyes when they're like talking to you and it can be quite annoying because it's like they're saying, I'm not interested about you sat there, I'm not bothered if you're listening or I'm saying what I'm saying because I say what I say. And but it can be quite if, he, if he has got his eyes closed, he's probably just trying to absorb what you're saying and, and think carefully yeah, about probably. it, so anyway, he doesn't misdiagnose I'm not, you. I'm not having a go at him. Well, I'm like just what? saying he was fifty odd, and I was happy that he was there telling me. <laughs> I don't know why you were watching his eyes when he was telling you about your insides. Because you can tell a lot by people's eyes. That's what I said about jellyfish. But you know, just lines in a face tell a few stories, and I don't think we should get rid of them lines. Brilliant. Wise words. Well, that's the end of, uh, show number four in this third series of The Ricky Gervais Show. So it's goodbye from me, Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant. Goodbye. And of course, Carl Pilkington. All right. Well, here we are, number five in a series of six of The Ricky Gervais Show with me, Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant. Hello there. And Carl Pilkington. All right. Well, Carl, you are officially a published author. Your book came out, The World of Carl Pilkington, and and a copy will go in the British Library. Will it? Well, yeah. they have to take every rubbish. I think it will go in the British Library lavatory. <laughs> yeah. From what I understand, yeah. it'll be in there <laughs> uh, with like a collection of like novelty postcards <laughs> and yeah, maybe exactly. a this compendium. But, you know. Yeah. So they have to. They take everything. Just think of that. But yeah. is that a rule they set up when when books were more important to people? And now it's kind of like, oh, I wish we never said we'd do that. Well, they have to add two miles of shelves every year, apparently. That's what I mean. Now, surely, you know, they change a lot of other rules, don't they? They used to allow people having their head cut off. And now they've gone, we shouldn't do that anymore, so we'll sort that. Why don't they just say, only so many books a year make it in there? Ones that are important to the future. But who knows what's important to the future? Well, you know, normally, when I say something that I think's a good point, uh Yeah, but you're always wrong. No, 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 but what I mean is when I say something that I think I have got a point there. Yeah, but you're always wrong. But why do they do this? Why do they think they've got to keep everything? Because it's- we're living in a world now where everything is sort of binnable and, you know, we- we use stuff- Binnable. Uh, for, binnable. for what it is. Well, that, that, I no, think I think you could say that. Oh, that's binnable, fine, yeah. that's fine. Um there was a sort of poetry to it, but I think he stumbled across that. I don't think it was intentional. Yeah, I mean, I'm st I still haven't got over last week him saying foodage. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean, though? That the, the world's changed, so why is that rule still hanging around when? Well, it's not a rule. I mean, it's not a rule that you know the the country's going to you know live and die by. It's just that it is seen as a. a, a a repository for knowledge, for information, and I don't believe any old Joe can wander in there and get one of these books. I think you have to either be a scholar, I think yeah. maybe it's open for a brief window for students, but you know, you can't, you can just wander in there and see your own book, Carl. 
you know. There are some books that uh, they have to turn the page for you in, in gloves, so your the amino acids. I don't uh, like. With yours, it won't matter. They just go. It's over there, or they throw it to you. No, it's just. Like or they slide. They slide it along the floor. They say, oh, I, "I can't give it to you, Carl, because it's propping up this desk." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they kick it to you and say, "Put it in the bog when you're finished with <laughs> yeah. it." It's just that thing of being timed, though. I hate it when people go, oh, "Have you read this?" And then yeah, I can't read it properly because I'm thinking they, they're thinking I'm taking ages here. Do you know what I mean? So I have to scan read it, and I go, "Oh, it's good that." And they go, "What do you think?" And I go, "About what?" <laughs> So I'd hate the fact that someone stood there with gloves on, cos that isn't normal relaxing sort of reading, <laughs> is it? But it's not- it's not- you don't go in to read the Doomsday book, let's say, in order to just have a relaxing read. You're going in there to study there it, you know, historically. To say they're professors and scholars and scientists and historians. They don't wander in because it's raining and they go, what's a good read? There's not a man wearing white gloves turning the pages of the latest Jackie Collins. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have heat? What, watching I... your lips move as you read to see if you can turn the next page. <laughs> I suppose I shouldn't really feel guilty because at the end of the day, right? I mean, people always rave about Shakespeare, saying, "Oh, you know, his mm. work was good." Mm. But Brilliant. at the same time, he probably put that on the book when he brings another one out. He put your review on it. Yeah. Oh, that was good, Carl Pilkington. But at the same time, you know, like, some people will have a go, I'm ready for for people having a go, like that Wendy did about me little films I made, there's always people- Wendy Robinson? Who, yeah, you know- It's her opinion. For those yeah, of you who didn't hear last week, she slammed Carl. No, well, you know, each to their own and that, and, uh, you know, if everyone liked the same thing, I don't know what we'd do, right? Sure. Um, you don't know anything. So, so, all I'm saying is, everybody raves about Shakespeare, mm. when, if you properly looked at what he did, he, he invented a lot of swearing words. Right? Effin and Jeffin and that. Now, if- That if, was one of his. Well, it's Effin and Jeffin and Effin and Jeffin part two. <laughs> did um, he make up a great deal of swear words? I don't know that did, I'm yeah, aware of this. A lot of them are Shakespeare invented. But all I'm saying is, for some reason, when things are, are brought out years ago, um, people say they're good even though they're not, is what I mean. But let's, let's not mistake the fact that Shakespeare is not, he's not- uh, people seem to confuse him as though they think he's he wrote these things in order to be read. He wrote them to be performed. They're plays. They're not books in the traditional sense. He didn't bring out the latest book. No, but just just when something's old, it gets a bit more respect. Is what I mean. When I was watching that documentary about the the real Indiana Jones, um, brilliant. They dug out um, some rocks with drawings on, and they were like, "Oh, don't damage them. Don't don't mark the paint." And, and it's like it's rubbish. It was like a stick fella with a yak. <laughs> and now, if that was found now, or if a kid brought show me that, I'd go, hey, it's not that good. So what I mean is, because stuff's old, old stuff gets respect. But you're not judging it on its aesthetic merits, you're judging it on its historical importance. I don't think that's fair, though, because when that, when that fella drew that, it wasn't old. He did it when he was knocking about. No, yes, but, but, you, but you, you must see the difference between you doing a, a, a stick man on a wall with a bit of chalk near your local, and a, a cave painting that, 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 that they date to 10,000 years ago. Yeah, so in 10,000 years time, when they find my story about the monkey fireman, will it gain more respect then than it is now? No, less. But why is it? Cause I, I, because people will more and more realise what a buffoon you are. The more research we do, the more these podcasts we do, no. the more you expose yourself as an empty, egg-headed uh, moron. That's a friend speaking right there, Richard Gervais. <laughs> No, he loves you like a brother. <laughs> I'm just, I just think, you've mentioned him before, Steve, this Peeps fella. Yes. Has he done anything else apart from a diary? Because now I've done, now I've done a book and a diary. That means you're better than Peeps, well, is just, what you're thinking, Well, isn't I'm it? not gonna say that until I know, but what else did he do? Well, Peeps wasn't a writer predominantly, I right. believe he was, uh, you know, like a bureaucrat or something. But he kept a diary which has since become a historical landmark. And what did he say in it? What did he say in it? Well, it's again more because it's both it's well written and it's also an amazing insight. A social into document a social as well. Document, yeah, yeah. It's a social document. I of mean, that yours period. is a social document, but it it sort of revolves around uh, having egg and chips and a calf and seeing a ladybird, which you know. But that's that's today's living. That's well, his just, yes, but his describes the Great Fire of London, which is what it's most. Yeah, it's but best we haven't had for. one of them. If we had one, I'd write it down. I'm only writing what's happening. The <laughs> ladybird happened, right? I wrote it down. He, he was just lucky. He was about in London when that happened. So you're a little angered that you've not witnessed one of the great disasters? Um, because the thing is, if they read your diary, 
they'd think, well, nothing happened that year. Nothing important in the world happened that year. Because your diary doesn't just mention, I mean, okay, yes, it does, it fails to mention any disasters in London because we haven't had any, but it doesn't mention any, it doesn't man mention any world events, it doesn't men mention wars in Iraq, but it, terrorism, it doesn't mention now. anything. But that's all being wrote about anyway. If you're saying there's a museum that's keeping everything, there's loads of other books on that. Who's looking at the fella whose skulls fell off? What? We see. It's interesting, isn't it? What do you mean the fella whose skulls fell off? Well, that's what happened the other week, so I wrote about what? it. What? A fella's skull has fell off. What do you mean, his skull has fell off? It's something to do with circulation. But what do you mean his skull fell well, off? Well, it's in the diary. We but how can a diary. skull fall off? Because it's surrounded by tissue and it's got a brain. How can just his skull, how can it, how can it detach itself from all the stuff surrounding you know, it? He mislaid all his dreams. But, but, <laughs> but all I'm saying is, that's, <sighs> that's not getting a look in. No, because it's not significant or probably true. Good point, Steve. I don't All right. Know well, let me just. I'll just. On. I'll just consult the diary quickly and find the uh, the moment with the man whose skull fell off. Oh, here we are. Yeah, looks like the world's fattest man is having an operation to get rid of some of the fat. Yeah. He has to have an iron bed because that's the only thing that can hold his weight. Yeah. There's also a man whose skull has fell out. He's in hospital somewhere. I hate that. It would make me panic. The hospital is busy with people coming in to look at the head. What are you talking about there? That tells us nothing. Right, it's impossible for a skull to fall out. It How are scholars in 10,000 years gonna be- what are they gonna decipher from that? They can sort of- There's not on. enough incident but, 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 detail. But, but, but how did his skull fall out? Circulation problems. But th answer the question, how did his skull fall out? Fall out of what? He was at home, um, and I don't know if he was combing his hair or something, but it, it come off. <laughs> what did? His skull. What do you mean, his skull? Do you know what the skull is? It's a part of the head. Well, it, no, it's the it's the structure of the head. It's the bone. Do you mean the top of the skull? This is only useful if you have all the salient facts. Then it would be of interest to us. We could we could. Well, that I, that I couldn't take that on. I'm busy. I'm not going to start looking into stuff in depth. Just get the <laughs> details. <laughs> God, <laughs> you're such an idiot. You are the best. Oh, idiot in the world! Well, I don't want to be premature, but that entry is followed by, I injured my toe the other day by dropping the toaster. Instead of letting it hit the floor, I tried to catch it with my foot. <laughs> I didn't think I'd done any harm, but my nail looks like it could fall off. I might show it to the doctor when I get me kidney stones out. We could easily get by without nails on the feet. They are more trouble than they're worth. You're so wrong. You're so wrong. I think on the days when cavemen without shoes and animals need nails, I don't think we need them now. I honestly, because you hear about uh, ingrowing toenails, right? So that's a problem. Um, you've got to cut them. Um, stuff gets under there and gets infected. Get rid of them. You won't have any of that as long as you wear shoes. No, you'd have unprotected toes and fingers, wouldn't you? I didn't say on the on the fingers, just on the toes. So why why do you need them on the fingers and not the toes? Because you still you use your you use your hands to do stuff. I've said about toenail out. It'd be good to have it growing on the head. What? Just having like a sheet of it, just just like <laughs> a, a nail on the forehead. <laughs> you wouldn't look weird because we'd all have it. I'm not saying. What just, are you talking about now? I'm just saying we've. I, I don't want to go on about evolution and stuff because we've done it all. What but, do you think the skull is for? No, but I mean on the outside, so that when you bang your head. It's a little bit more protection. Like, like people. I mean, you're looking at me like that. Why do you wear a helmet on a bike then? <laughs> because, <laughs> because the bike wasn't meant to be invented. We weren't meant to whiz along at seventy miles an hour with evolution. I know, but, you, but because life's changing, like you've said. Let's but you stick can't. The... You can't go. Let's evolve. Let's re-evolve. Okay, let's assume we've got this nail on our head uh, that's growing out of our forehead. So we look like one big thumb. Yeah. Uh, which weirdly, Carl kind of, I mean, you can almost imagine it looking at Carl now. You could imagine a big nail there. Does the nail great. continue to grow? Do we have to trim the head nail? Uh, yeah, in the same way you get hair cut. Why is that preferable in your mind to just wearing a crash helmet in instances where you might have something hit your head? Just because, um, for a start, helmets, you have to carry them around with you. That's one thing that's put me off having a motorbike. Whenever you see someone on a motorbike, <laughs> it's all like the clothes you've got to wear. And it's like a big upheaval, isn't it? It's, it's, you know, if you have a car, you can get in with your shorts on, your flip-flops on. A motorbike, it's like, it's yeah. like you're an astronaut or something, you're only nipping down the road for some milk. 
you know what I mean? So, <laughs> get rid- what I'm saying is get rid but of- But does it annoy you having to put shoes on every day and underpants and a, a vest and a- I don't know. No, but once they're jacket. on, I'm not carrying them. They're on me. If I had to then take the shorts off for whatever reason and walk around holding them, I'd go, oh, I can't be bothered. I don't like holding a bag. I don't mm -hmm. like bags. We carry too much around with us now. I don't like carrying stuff. It's just a, a hassle, isn't it? <laughs> it's just endless <laughs> things he doesn't want to do, he doesn't like doing, he doesn't like carrying bags. I mean, Who the hell has a gripe about carrying bags? Why just, is that a concern? Because it's- it's stuff that's on- on I you. I love the way that he wouldn't mind having a nail going out of his <laughs> fucking head, but he doesn't <laughs> want to carry a bag. What's good with it is, everybody's got one of these. And- But it's- it's not gonna happen, Carl. And the most important thing in your body, apart from the heart, is your brain. So protect that, not the toes. The toes <laughs> we can get by Please, without the toes. people. But your head's important, isn't it? There's a mm. lot of stuff in your head. Um, and I know all this, just after seeing the- the body works thing, I went to see- the uh, it's a show on where there's a load of like dead bodies and that, and uh, you can see how much stuff's in the body, and it's there's loads of stuff. There's nothing in there that you don't need. It's all doing stuff. Everything in your well, body. We've been but telling you, you that for years. It. But you reckon they don't need the toenails? Yeah, that's on the outside. I'm saying everything that's on the inside of your body, right? You don't need the appendix. No, but it, that it doesn't that depend on what what lifestyle you have. Well, it's a, it's a hangover of when we, uh, probably ate a lot more cellulose and it's, it's... Yeah, well, they, it's they might come back. Things are always coming back, aren't they? So if people start eating them again... What about male nipples? Uh, sort of looks all right, though, doesn't it? Because the chest is quite plain, so with, with nothing on it, you'd go, oh, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> it just balances it out. I think it looks all right. I think it works. So <laughs> leave it. Um, but what were we talking about? But w wouldn't you rather have, um, maybe a little, uh... Like a rib cage around the testicles, because you get a whack in them and it. Oh. Um. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um. It's not an invention, Carl. It's not an invention, and we can't do it. But. But would you be able to sit down still? Because that's the good thing with them at the moment is movement. <laughs> so it sort of works. But don't they say? Um, they said something about testicles, like the body works thing. Well, they're on the outside. <laughs> Put yours away, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> You're not one of the exhibits. <laughs> uh, they're on the outside because they have to be a few degrees below body temperature for the, I think, the Satoli cells to. to, to so work. that's that's an odd design that they had to go there because it is a daft. It's a bit of an odd place to have them. Where would you suggest? Probably, Dangling from the throat. Um, sort of. I want to redesign you, right? You, 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 you can possibly do this now. This is something you can actually do, probably. You could probably have your testicles anywhere. So where would you want them? You've got a giant forehead nail. Yeah. You could have that. It probably wouldn't grow, but we could certainly have that. that I, I just mean like, uh, cause if, if all it's about is temperature, you don't yeah. want to get them too hot. Yeah. Well, they're getting hot down there cause you're wearing pants and what have you. Mm. So have them nearer to the outside of the, s of the body. Well, they are near the outside of the body. No, but we wear pants over them. So you what? wear pants over them because their their testicles and polite society suggest that you don't show your. Yeah, but testicles. that's the odd thing, isn't it? That's what's happened somehow that we've that we've said testicles shouldn't be seen. Well, then just cut a hole, cut a hole in your trousers. If it's only about, you know, keeping them cool, and because they're too hot, why don't you just hang them out your shorts? Because there's too many sort of seats that are shared these days, isn't they? But what I'm saying is. Well, what are you saying? Where, well, where would, you, would you put them? Somewhere like. Um, Sort of under the ears, so it sort of just looks like lobes. So uh, you would redesign your body to have a pair of testicles hanging from your ears. And when people are sometimes talking, they do sort of mess with their ears, and they're always saying, "Check for lumps." More <laughs> handy. <laughs> <laughs> Does the penis remain where it is? At Leave the that where it is. Yeah. Well, I I don't know about you, Rick, but I would love to see. Perhaps on the web, you know, it's very easy to put stuff on web pages now. Some kind of illustration, it could be computer generated, could it be drawn by hand, yeah. of the new model Carl. Bear in mind, people, that he's got some testicles underneath his ears. And a th big thumbnail on his forehead. Big thumbnail on his forehead. Um, talking to Carl, I want to see Carl's head everywhere. It's the roundness that I like, okay? So, do a viral campaign. Anyone out there 
with a picture of Carl, just get it everywhere. Because I want eventually everyone to, as they walk past him in the street, to shout, you shaved monkey, or look at that bald head, or look at fucking coconut face coming this way. you got a head like a fucking orange. Went out the other night with the lads. Um, you know, there's a few of us, you know, young, free and single. You Must look like the swingers. Oh, it was pretty, it looked like a boy band had gone out. It looked like, really? It looked like, you know, NSYNC had hit oh, the streets. Right, yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. We'd all, we'd dressed up, talked up, out for a few drinks. A friend of mine said, let's go to a club. Right, I haven't been to a nightclub for a long time, actually, I haven't been. Is that because your glasses steam up when you walk in out of the cold? That is a problem in the winter. I genuinely, it's not, it's very difficult to make a good impression when you, as you walk in, <laughs> your glasses steam up straight away and, you know, you, you've got to take them off and clean them and stuff. <laughs> And then, you know, you get a bit of On oh, your wife runs, you pull yeah. your wife runs up yeah. through the jeans, yeah. clean them on that. Or the back of a girl's dress. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, we cruise down to the club, it's one of those big sort of super clubs, London super clubs. Never been in one of those, the Ministry or any of those things, so it was all new. And, uh, it's a bit of a queue, I think it's a bit of a chore. But we're queuing up, we're in good spirits, we're looking at it, it sounds pretty funky, we can hear the music coming out. You know, been in the queue for quite a while, 20, 25 minutes. Forget it, 25 minutes. Well, yeah, we were pretty excited by this point. The doorman says, uh, hello lads. He said, yeah, we're we coming, please. He went, no, you're not. I went, really? What? He said, we're not, you're not coming in. And he just immediately lifted the little rope and sent us away from the queue, right? And we were slightly perplexed. We were, we were dumbfounded. We didn't know what to do. We, we, it was like this, it, this it couldn't be happening. It didn't make sense. We just que queued up what was going on. And so, um, my friend said, well, we've got to find out why he's not going to let us in. So he goes yeah. back over. I thought you wanted to do. You wanted to tie him up with logic. That'll show a bouncer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Show him how educated you are and how you can win an argument and make him look stupid. You'll be in that club in no time. <laughs> That's what they appreciate. <laughs> they love that. Because what they respect is being made to look like a fool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we went over and, uh... <laughs> they, they really look up to intellectuals. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> so one of our mates goes over and he says, uh, why didn't you let us in? And he went, because you didn't have any girls with you. Now, <laughs> now, I'll tell you this, that's kicking you when you're down. Because when you're out on a Saturday night trying to get into a club to meet women, and the reason you're not allowed to go in a club to meet women is because you haven't got any women with you, that's just salt in the wound. It's so humiliating. So, um, a friend of mine says that there's a VIP entrance over there. And it was like a woman with a clipboard, you know, the guest list. Uh, separate entrance. She said, you know, you've got a little bit of profile, Steve. Why don't we try and use your you little bit of You ran got your Golden Globe in your Emmy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I always, uh, I always carry, uh, you know, some of my cuttings with me. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, so, and I felt a bit self-conscious about that. I was thinking, I'm not into this, you know, it's uh, a bit awkward. But he said, look, don't worry, you just stand here. Just stand here, just like you're having a conversation. I'll go over, I'll say, I'll point him out, I'll go, oh, there's, you know, Steve Merchant over there, they're, they're at the office or whatever. Oh, God! Steve. So I thought, well, you know, well, the thing is, we were out, and I was, I was a bit frustrated, and I thought, you know, uh, we may as well try everything. So, um, so I stand there, with my friend goes over, and he has a word, and he comes back, and he says, uh, it's fine. She's, she can't let us in the VIP entrance because she's not allowed, but what she can do is walk us to the front of the queue, right? And walk in front of the queue and explain. So I think, okay, fine. Oh, God. So oh, the guy, uh, God. The guy takes me and my mates, right, this girl, she takes us, she, we walk past everyone else, right, to the front of the queue, right? She goes up to the guy, she says, uh, this is Steve Merchant, office. The guy goes, I know he is, we're not letting him in. <laughs> oh, God! Oh, God! By now, of course, some people have recognised me, so they're having, trying to have my photo taken. So there's people inside the, uh, line that's being allowed in the club. I've got to lean across the rope. So I have my photo taken with them, even though I'm not allowed in the club. So they go, oh, all right, this is Steve, they're having the photos taken, right, camera phones and that. They're going into the club where the music, the party's kicking off. I'm outside waiting for the next chump who wants to have his photo taken. I mean, it was <laughs> mental. So, um... That's unbelievable. I was furious. And then one guy, I remember he was, he was chatting, and he, he goes, oh, yeah, brilliant, I love the podcast and all that stuff. I love, Car is Carl with you? I said, oh, Carl's not out here. And his girlfriend, who, his girlfriend was with me, she went, Who's that? And he went, oh, it's just Steve Merchant, he does the office, he does the thing. And she went, who, who cares? Who are you, Bruce Forsyth? 
and it's that thing when suddenly I'm being humiliated and embarrassed <laughs> by someone's girlfriend. I never asked for that. I never asked for her opinion on me. I'm sorry if I don't impress you, if I'm not sufficiently famous for you, but it's not my fault. <laughs> it's your boyfriend who brought it up. It was like I got over to her and tried to show off, and she was annoyed. I was, so by now I was just furious. Oh, so God. I thought, forget this. Well, I was walking down the street, and there's a, a group of, uh, um, builders, um, sitting down having a cup of tea. One of them goes, all right, Rick. I went, all right, mate. The other one went, not as fat as on telly. <laughs> I went, oh, thanks. Not as fat as on telly. So he went with, well, you are fat, but you look even fatter on telly. He didn't say, oh, God, you don't look fat at all. Or, oh, you look, you, you, you look, you look big on telly, but you don't look fat. Just went with, not as fat as on telly. But and there's nothing I could say, but cheers, mate. Now, when you said cheers, mate, because you, did you say that because you were, because I'd say cheers, mate, because I'd be a little bit scared of them. No, I was I'd just, be it was like, the like sarcasm and, you know, I laughed or I laughed or Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, you can get away with sarcasm I'm, with working class blokes. I'm I a little could, bit more secure with a working class man no, than you, aren't I? I'm terrified of them. I feel like they're gonna turn on me at any minute. You don't feel confident sort of backing in a lorry driver? Terrified. Oh, right, Because okay. if I did, he'd, le he'd probably lean out and just go, go and get your dad, mate. Yeah, not you. Fuck off, I'm not interested. Not you. Yeah. So, um, so the final stab is this guy says, uh, there's a party I know of going on, right? Oh, blinking out. So we go down to this party, right? As we're getting there, as we're about to go in, he goes, now you know it's a singles party. I thought, oh, what? He says, you know it's a singles party. Oh, God. So I go in this party, it's right, it's all single people, right? Now, theoretically, that should be brilliant, right? If you're a singleton yourself. It's the worst kind of party to go to. Because when you normally go to a party, right, and you're chatting to a girl, and she says, um, oh, I gotta go and get a drink or whatever. You think, oh, she's probably got a boyfriend or whatever, or she, you know, she's with mates, that's fair enough. But when you're at a singles party, and a woman says, I'm just gonna go and get a drink, and then you just see her leaving, <laughs> you, you realise it's not because she's got a boyfriend or whatever, it's just because she doesn't want to talk to you. <laughs> you can't even kid yourself. You can't even pretend. Oh, and you, dear. you suddenly sense everyone judging everyone else. So you see a girl and she'll like, look at you, look at you up and down, and then, ignore you and walk on. And it's just, it's like a massive slap in the face. It's like girls coming up to you and going, not interested. Just by being there, they don't have to say anything and they're rejecting you. And so, um, so we're trying to, anyway, my friend, one of my friends has been reading this book, The Game, right, by this guy called Neil Strauss, which is sweeping a certain part of the population because it is one of those books written on how to meet women and seduce women, right? And there's this guy called Neil Strauss who infiltrated a sort of secret organisation in America of blokes who've got all these various seducing techniques, right? And one of the techniques which we've been discussing is something called negging, where if you see a very attractive woman, the theory is that she's getting asked out all the time by blokes, right? They're always coming up and saying, oh, you're really beautiful, can I buy you a drink? And that what you have to do to set yourself away from the pack is to sort of not be so obviously complimentary. So you come up and you almost sort of pay her a backhanded compliment, or you almost neg, as they say, say something slightly negative. So you, what you might say is you might go up to her and say, oh, I like your shoes, I've seen another girl wearing them in the club, right? And the theory is that she's sort of, oh, and it, she's a bit taken aback, she's a bit th thrown off, and then, of course, you start complimenting her, and you start building her back up again. It's very elaborate mind games, I'm not saying it's a good idea, but we'd been talking about the neg, and I was chatting to a girl, and I was a little bit drunk, and I wasn't thinking it through, and I thought about the neg, because it wasn't going very well, but, but I don't think you should say to a girl, <laughs> I think your ears are a bit too big for your head. Because, <laughs> like, you know what I mean, it's like you can't come back from that. And it's, there's nowhere else to go, because that really is just an insult. <laughs> oh, he's only gone and listened it down the little fucking car! I'm going to do it on my own fucking car! That jingle, of course, signifying yet another reading from Carl Pilkington's diary. As always, packed with rich insight into the man's mind. Had a late night last night because I stayed up to watch a programme about monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> it's already good! <laughs> of course it is. It's already good! Now before I read on, I mean, is this not some kind of monkey news? Is this not a late return to monkey news? Uh, well it's not, it's not that good. Is it not? Whereas the other monkey news is- Oh chimpanzee that! It's more shit! This is what he says. It, this is what he gleaned from the programme about monkeys. It sat on a bridge and wanted stuff off people to walk over the bridge. What? So it was acting as some kind of toll booth. This was is it? ridiculous. No, it was a bridge in in like the jungle. Oh, shut the fuck up! And it's a monkey that sat on a bridge, and um, a lot of tourists 
go through the area. No, it's to, a monkey to look up the who realised that, that if he sits there, he gets stuff because it looked like it's a cute little chimp begging. No, but every time. Yeah, because you give a monkey, you give it. Oh, I'm as bad as him now. If you give a chimpanzee uh, a banana uh, uh, and he starts realising that humans have things to give, yeah, but it's all squirrels sorts of learn stuff. that. If you don't go, oh, you wouldn't say, oh, went to the park. The squirrels waiting at the gate. You have to give them a toll to go in. They're very good to give them nuts. They come up to you every time. You, you fucking idiot. Went to bed after watching it and fell asleep thinking about it on the bridge right now. It's a bit bad, really, because the monkey should work harder for its food. It made me remember the slug I saw yesterday that was eating bird poo. <laughs> Nobody would ever help a slug with food like they do with ducks and monkeys. A slug's life is pretty bad. The only time they come out of their den is when it's raining. Den. So, so even their days out are depressing. <laughs> it is. Do you know what I mean? No. It is like, it's a horrible thing to be, isn't it? <laughs> a slug. <laughs> talking about what is it like to be a slug no just because like the monkey even though it's been quite aggressive everyone was like oh give it some water and it was it was well like kitted out it had like you know chocolate bars bottled water some like you know fizzy stuff and all that an ipod it was listening to monkey news it could have had one if it wanted one it was getting away with murder on that bridge and that's just because it was furry yeah if that was like a blob like a slug there's no way people would be that friendly towards it and it just annoys me how you get this pecking order for like, no matter what creature you are, favouritism. And that slug was only eating that bird poo because it wasn't being offered stuff. If it was offered toffees or whatever. <laughs> well, it's just sad, isn't it? It's, it's come to that. That's where its life has come to. <laughs> yeah, but it's not a it mollusk like that's down it's... on its fucking <laughs> yeah, lap. It didn't live in a big country house no, and this wife left it the kids when it started hitting the ball. And I kind of thought, and look, they do only come out in the rain and it's depressing and it'll probably get killed in a bit. And that was its last meal. I just. It, <laughs> Meal. People but it wouldn't care. prefer steak and chips, Carl. It no, doesn't a leaf. have. It must like a leaf or a. a you know, at the end of the day, it's an insect. They love it. It's leaf. not an insect. Well, it's part of that gang. It's part of that. <laughs> no, it's part it's of that. They hang out together. They it's hang out not. together. No, Why do you think it's part of that because gang? Because it, it knocks about in the woods in the same place as a spider does. But all I'm, uh, what I'm saying is they, they're eating boring stuff because that is what's. It's in not their boring area. stuff to them. They're not. I have no opinion of it at all. They take in sustenance. No, but where you are is what you eat. When I'm in London, I'll have beans on toast for lunch. On holiday, what? Tapas, go on, I'll have a bit. <laughs> so it's whatever you eat, what's in that area. Suzanne went off to work and I went to the shop to buy some envelopes. The shop was empty, but the fellow behind the counter was on the phone and just kept talking, even though he could see I was waiting. I started to count backwards from 20. <laughs> When I got to six, he hung up and served me. I won't use the shop again. Question, why count backwards from 20? So he's thinking, what's going to happen at one? If I start counting from one, he's going, well, let him carry on. What, out loud? So, not, not really loud, but like, uh, more of a mouth action, so he could see who was doing it. Do you know like Sorry, that? you, you just started miming counting backwards to a man in a shop? He's on the phone. The yes. shop is empty. Yes. I thought he'd like me custom. He could have served me and stay on the phone. Even though I don't like that, at least he's still doing what, what you know, he needs to do. I just said, sorry, can I just get these, please? Yeah. Well, I stood there and I thought, it's annoying me now, my kidney's a aching and I started to get a bit of a sweat on. So I thought, right, I'm going to give him 20 seconds and if he hasn't got off the phone, I'm leaving. And when I got to, when I got to about six, he, he served me. What's wrong with that? Again, you are giving one yourself of the strangest people. It's just giving yourself a, a thing. I could have been stood there free. for ages. He's one of the strangest people who's free to walk. Yeah, it's the about streets. no. I set myself a little target, and I thought I don't want to waste another thirty seconds in here. I'll give him twenty. It worked. He served me at six. But it didn't work. Yeah, but did he do it because you were doing that, or did he finish his phone call? I don't know. I was busy counting. <laughs> <laughs> Looked at what's been going on in the world. There was a human head attached to a seagull's body in a jar. Is that all it says? This is the sort of weird stuff that goes on behind surgery doors. I doubt it ever flew because the head would have been too heavy. Well, of course it wasn't. It didn't happen. It wasn't live. No, but they try this stuff, don't they? That's like that program I watched with a, a well, monkey. Well, who ever. has ever tried to put a human head on a seagull's body? They've done loads of stuff like that. It's part of us moving on, isn't it? It's what are you talking about? I'm not going to get into arguing about well, science you're wrong. because it's all Don't behind talk closed shit. doors. How do you think we can change a, a a heart now from another body? You have to try things out. It's trial and error. 
all sorts of weird stuff goes on in hospitals, but we let it happen because it's to help us out in the long run, isn't it? But what, what are they aiming towards when they're going to find out if you can put a head on a seagull's body? What is that, what, what, what are they want to learn and what do they, how do they want to apply that knowledge? A new heart, it is obviously for a reason, it saves a life. Yeah, what is this, to, to save money on transport? Instead of getting a bus pass, you go, can, you, can I put my head on the seagull's body? I go, well, it won't work. Well, we'll try it. <laughs> yeah, but it is, there is odd things like that. Like, uh, I saw a fish the other day, right? right. And uh, honestly, it's the weirdest thing. It was just like a blob with a face. <laughs> now, I would never have said, yeah, let that swim about. I'd have killed it from day dot. I would have gone, <laughs> get rid of that. <laughs> oh, God! Under what circumstances would you have killed that from day dot? Oh, wh I'm just saying, looking at it, I'd say that does not work. And it looked sad. It looked like it didn't want to be about. Have you got her number? <laughs> Well, that's it for another week. Um, the end of uh, episode five. One more to go in this series of six of the Ricky Gervais show. Um, we'd love you to uh, buy Carl's book because because uh, it is genuinely, it is genuinely interesting and funny as a, as a you know, just as a social experiment to see that uh, you know proves Carl's theory wrong that a monkey can write a book. Um, so uh, it's bye from me, Ricky Gervais. Goodbye from Steve Merchant. Goodbye. And goodbye from the little shaven monkey that is Carl Pilkington. Hello and welcome to the last in this series of six of the Ricky Gervais Show with me, Ricky Gervais, Steve Merchant. Hello. And Carl Pilkington. All right. Carl, as you're aware, you've obviously got many celebrity fans. David Bowie is a fan, um, people involved with creating The Simpsons. Mm. And you've also got a new fan, Warwick Davis, who is the short actor that many people will see in films like uh, Return of the Jedi, he also is in Harry Potter, he's three foot six and Ricky and I worked with him recently on extras. And uh, far from asking us about the uh, many celebrity names that we've worked with, the only person he was interested in talking about of course, Mr K Pilkington. He wanted to meet you Carl. Yeah. Well is he, is he alright to get on with? Well, why wouldn't he be? Um, just because sometimes when people aren't normal it's well, just... just Sorry? No, I just mean when, when someone, like, I've met a few little people in my time. The one that I, I, I met, I met a little fellow once and he was all right. He got drunk really quick. Yeah. Uh, but he was all right, but it took me by surprise. Only because, like, like I've said about when I met Steve for the first time, it's only that same thing. And then if I lived with the little fellow, I'm sure we'd get on a storm. What do you mean when you met There's Steve? There's a TV show waiting to happen. <laughs> What do you mean when you met Steve for the first time? No, we've done it, you know, when he walked in, it just a bit of a, oh, he's different. But then, I, I see Steve every week, and, you know, the it same is... way I say I like watching Elephant Man, mm -hmm. from the first time I watched it, to the last, totally different. When he walks in the first time, it's like, oh god, look at that. It's a mess, isn't it? When I watch it again, it's kind of like, oh, here he is, here's John. So, it doesn't, it, it, things wear off, that's, that's like the world, isn't it? Things don't amaze you as much as you see things and you use things often. And it's the same with the little fella you're talking about. First time I see him, it, I'd, I'd be a little bit like, oh, what do you say? You know, what shouldn't I say? Whereas once you get to know him, I'm sure he'd, he'd be a lovely little fella. <laughs> I don't know where to start, Steve. Well, Warwick, I think, suspected as much. Um, he's offered you a, a, an interesting fact, actually. You're wearing headphones now. Apparently you wear those headphones for just one hour and it will multiply the amount of bacteria in your ear by over 700 times. But why is he worrying about that? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not worrying about it. He thinks it's of interest to you it because is, you're wearing it? headphones. It's part of your profession. You wear headphones, yeah. But Warwick asks, really, um, what are your thoughts on short people, particularly in entertainment? Because, of course, they've, uh, throughout the ages, made an appearance, particularly in fiction. Tom Thumb, of course. Mm. Uh, the Oompa Loompas. What do I think of them? He's just wondering, you know, I suppose, what your take is. Um, they're all right. I mean, when I was on jury duty, when you when you go in in the morning, you have to go into a big, um, sort of waiting room. And, uh, 
every day I'd sort of see one pop in and he'd be sort of struggling getting on the chair. And it sort of, it was, it was kind of something to watch. It was different. That's, that's what's good with, with, with things in life. If, if you look at stuff and you go, oh, look at that. And seeing him struggle on the chair, he was happy. He wasn't, he wasn't, str you know, he wasn't struggling in a way that he felt uncomfortable. He'd obviously climbed a lot of chairs in his time. And this was just another one. And I'd, w watching him, it just makes you, makes you think, you go, you know, I should appreciate that I don't have that problem every time I have to sit down and what have you. But I don't, uh, you know, I don't think it's that bad. If I had to pick being really tall or really small, I'd go for the really small one because, you know, it's, it, the world's a more interesting place for him, isn't it? Everything's bigger. Do you know what I mean? We go to New York and go, wow, look at this. And they go and they go, oh, dear. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Everything's a lot bigger. Everything's more amazing. Food portions. Everything's a bonus. So out of the two, I'd be small. And maybe that's what I'd chat to Warwick about for a bit just to get to know get to know him. Brilliant. It's a shame in a way that he's not been able to pop in. I'd like to hear that conversation. But I've got, um, you know, speaking of like weird stuff and that, I've got a new... <laughs> well, we uh, weren't, but go on. No, I've got a new book. Do you know I had that Freaks book? <laughs> Top 50 Freaks. Got a new one sent to me. Really? Uh, yeah. And do you know, like, everything um, normally has a name. So, like, if it's uh, the two-headed fella, you know, they're all nicknames like that, aren't they? They've got two nicknames, I imagine. Uh, but this new book I've got, right, yeah. on the cover of this one, it's got, like, a woman with three breasts, right? And she's called the, the three-breasted woman, as you'd expect. <laughs> uh, and there's a... Uh, what else was in there? There's, uh, there's a fella, uh, the one face... Why is she posing nude, though? That's what I want to know. Showing off. It's not the worst disability, is it? Well, just you've got three, it doesn't mean you have to get them out for the... Oh. For the lads, does it? Tart. I know. Well, she looked happy. <laughs> and there was a, a fellow with, like, one, one face but two bodies. What do you mean one face but two <laughs> bodies? <laughs> one face, two bodies. What do you mean it's one weird. face, two bodies? <laughs> Surely you one head, two bodies. Uh, head as well, but it was mainly the face. That was weird, because he looked fed up. <laughs> sort of what are you talking about? How what can you are you have talking a face about? Without a head? How can you have? What do you mean? How did it join to the neck? Well, it did. It did have a, a head, but the fact is, it, it was weird that I had one face to me. What do you mean? Well, if you've got one head, had, you'd yeah, have one face. Yeah, I know, but it was just. It was the fact that he had one face and two bodies that I didn't think. But why do you keep saying one <laughs> face and two bodies as opposed to one, one head? head and two bodies? <laughs> We're all the man with one face. Yeah, but now I've got one body. Yeah, he's well, surely he's the man with two bodies then. Again, the description. You, I, roll I've up, got, roll up, see the man with one face. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah! He's just got, like, a face and then one neck and it splits off into two bodies. It's <laughs> really weird. It Honestly, doesn't... it's weird. It's, it, it was ages ago. Well, it, no. Uh, no, it doesn't happen. So it's, it's full of stuff like that, right? And what I'm saying is, that fella, you know, the one-faced man, the three-breasted woman... He wouldn't be known as the one-faced man, is what I'm saying. Well, they've all... That, they that all, isn't the peculiar thing about him. Yeah, well, they all had names like that. Right. But there was one thing in it that didn't even have a nickname. It was so weird. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? It was ju it just said un unidentified. What, what does it look like? Um, Sort of... sort of testicles for eyes. <laughs> That's, 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 it just reminded me when you were talking about What do you mean, strange. testicles fried? And what is it, did he have a normal body? I didn't even look at that. Oh, for f but So- That's what I'm saying, though, you're attracted to, to the odd, oddness of the thing. And that's what I was saying about Warren when he walks in. Warwick. Warwick. You know, it, it, it'll be odd for a minute. And then, I'm sure- For him, it'll for him it will be, yeah. <laughs> he'll get used to you. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, like I've said, I'm surprised that it, things like that don't happen more, because- Especially after being in hospital and seeing how the body works and that. You have how no idea it... how the body works. No, honestly, I've got me right, a bit. Right, you have no idea. You've learnt nothing. I I've got me You've learnt nothing since the age of seven. I've got me head round it a bit more. And, and the way that there's loads of people in the world, mm. and yet you don't see people with, like, dangly eyes more often, it amazes me. <laughs> I love the fact that he's amazed by not seeing freaks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's incredible. He's walking down the street going, oh, everyone's got one head. That's yeah. weird. Suzanne, see any dangly eyes today? No, <laughs> me neither. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? What's going on in the world? <laughs> oh. 
Warwick's not been the only correspondent. We've had a number of people. Remember years ago we used to uh, encourage people to send in questions, and those questions have been drifting in ever since, really. Just things that people want to throw at you, see how your mind works, Carl. Do you mind answering a few? Uh, no. I suppose you might loosely term these philosophical questions, or at least questions that might help you think, ponder on some of the bigger ideas. Yeah. This is your forte, Carl. Philosophy, isn't it? Yeah. Question one. Carl, are all men born equal? Well, we've talked about Warren. Warwick. Say if like the pillow man, right, the fellow with no arms and legs, if everyone was like that, he wouldn't be, it, that wouldn't be a disability. He'd be equal to everyone else, wouldn't he? When someone fights for equality, it doesn't mean they want to be treated literally the same. For example, uh, 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 it's usually about a prejudice, isn't it? Or a lack of opportunity. Yeah. If um, you were, uh, just to think of uh, uh, equal opportunities in terms of uh, a job, yeah. Um, if um, you needed someone uh, for a, a lookout on a lighthouse and a blind person went along, they couldn't do the job. Whereas if it was uh, listening for stuff and you didn't give it to the blind person because you were worried about, hmm, don't know, blind people, that would be uh, imposing a prejudice because he could hear as well as you. So if he was the best for that job he should get it despite his other disability um but i'm i'm sh pretty sure yeah your ears are important in a light i'm pretty sure he's coming down on the wrong side of the argument steve I'm keep pretty, going keep going go on no i just want to hear it yeah i mean if they want to go go for any job go for it but then don't moan if you don't get it that's that's all I think. Is yeah, that your equal opportunity statement? Um, <laughs> that's your statement. Well, I don't tech anyone on, so I don't have all these worries. But I'm just saying, if I was in charge of that lighthouse, and the deaf fella turned up, uh, was he deaf or blind? Well, it depends. I gave you there two was scenarios. one of each. There was a deaf guy and a blind guy, and no one else. <laughs> <laughs> I put another advert in. Okay, well, we've, we've got another question here, which I suppose in some respects uh, is along the same lines. <laughs> Do you believe in the notion that history is written by the victors, and consequently... Well, don't that... tell him what, that, what the upshot no, of that is. No, I was just saying, consequently, what does that mean? Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. And consequently, what does that mean for history, as we understand it? Just that, uh, stuff's written by the people who won it, type thing. Won what? Won whatever they did. But what, what yeah. But well, if it's, if it's a war, the ones well, who won it wrote it. But yeah. of course you're going to do that. That's what you do, isn't it? You shout about it if you win something. If you lose, you go, oh, don't talk about that, it's depressing. No, it no, no, doesn't or, mean that at all. Or because they're not around. Well, it means it, it, very often if, uh, if someone has conquered a nation or set up uh, um, a dominance somewhere, that they keep an eye on, on what goes out, what, what's, you know, propaganda or whatever, or what's taught in schools, you know. But it's even more significant than that, because it comes down to the very, very minute pieces of information that we see in every walk of life, you know. Prior to black people having their freedom when they were slaves, history, or the history of black people, was not being written by black people. Therefore, it was always seen through white eyes, which often explained, justified, or excused, or dismissed, or didn't even mention many of the abhorrent things that happened. So it's hugely significant. Um, I suppose you can have, bring out two books, you know, uh, I mean there's loads of books, isn't there? I've brought one out. If, if I can get one out, bring, let, let, let the losers bring one out, is what I mean. Just let everyone have a book, and then you decide, you know, let people decide which one they want to read. Um, I think they did it with some story where it was like you decide the end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was largely a point this exercise, wasn't it? He's got no idea. Carl, do you believe that the future is fixed? Do you believe that your life unfolds as a matter of destiny? I've heard something about this, where there's some system that it is laid out for you. And even well, if, if you want, say if I wanted chicken for me tea, mm. um, I really fancy having chicken. But when I get to the supermarket, the fellow goes, we haven't got any chicken, you're having beef. They say that 
that was already laid out for you, and that day you were having beef, no matter what happened. Fatalism. There's a there's a there's a, a slightly more attractive um, theory uh, uh, called determinism, where um, they say it's well, not so much. Well, that's if you want chicken, you'd, you'd go to the next supermarket and you'd go. Well, I'm going to find it. it. Doesn't mean no. Yeah, it doesn't mean you're determined in that sense. Like you've got a. You're definitely going to have chicken tonight. <laughs> it means that it was determined, as in predetermined. Um, uh, but all, all determinism basically says is that, you know, it's not whether you can, you know, choose. It's whether you can choose your choice. Because it's, you know, it's to do with brain states. And we think we, uh, you know, we have the illusion of free will because you go, oh, I have a drink. Oh, a fancy Coke. But something in you happened that meant you wanted coke. Well, this is weird, right? Because do you know how I've been in hospital, having me kidney stones done and what have you? Uh, well, as they do in hospitals, and this is why I don't like going in them. Did I just try and explain determinism to Carl Pilkington? Yeah, what I the didn't want to stop you, but... I mean, what, no, what but am I thinking? It just made you look, you look more of an idiot than I him. know, exactly. Yeah, I feel stupid. Yeah. But I'm, I'm in hospital, right? And like I've said to you, the annoying thing is when you're in hospital, they didn't just have a play about with the kidney. Whilst they're there, they're fiddling about with other bits, right? <laughs> and they're like, oh, let's have a that's feel. That's libelous. Uh, no, no, but it, that's what they do. Whilst you're in, let's have a, you know, prod about. They took some blood, right? And they said to us, uh, they said, now the weird thing is, these kidney stones you had, it was probably caused by too much calcium, right? That's what they are. They're a calcium build-up where you're not flushing it out, and so it's... Yeah. Now, the weird thing is there, I don't like having cornflakes. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, what you were just saying there is your mind or whatever, I've asked you before, I don't know what's in charge, but say like- <laughs> You don't, do you? Say like when I get up in the morning, normally Suzanne will have some Rice Krispies, and she's mm. like, do you want some, right? Just yeah. have some. And I'm like, no. Now that isn't me saying no, that's the calcium, that's my body going, I don't need any milk, don't give me milk, I'll have a crumpet. <laughs> now bear in mind, Rick, that w in the space of three minutes, we've gone from your definition of determinism to him having a lovely crumpet for breakfast. There's no one else in the world you can have a conversation with where you can make that distance no, that, that, that quickly. I, but it is interesting <gasps> how, how my body- have you ever had it, right? Sometimes I can go but ages- no, your body lied to you, because your body said you don't need water, you don't need water, you don't need water. No, oh, yeah. It, like today before I left. Suzanne said, what do you want? Straight away, I said, I need some leaks. Now, <laughs> what, what, whatever <laughs> I've- that operation I've had has obviously taken out whatever leaks give me. I'm lacking on that. <laughs> See, I think- I think he probably has it more than the rest of us, because he- I think he uses his subconscious more than us. We think about stuff. He is like the leech yeah. that is going on chemical memory. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That jingle there signifying, of course, once again, another reading from the diary of Carl Pilkington. Now, of course, for those of you who have not been keeping abreast of Carl's medical complaints, um, just bring us up to speed, Carl. You had to go into hospital this week because previously you'd had I've been treatment. in and out, honestly. I've been yeah. in and out of that hospital just with, uh, kidney problems, um, really painful and what have you. And, uh, yeah. He had so kidney stones, all right? No, no, but seriously. Monday. I had a bit of a lion today because I have to get up early for my operation tomorrow. Not only have I got to have tubes shoved up my knob, but I also have to get up at 5.50. Suzanne said I could have what I want for my last dinner. It's not your last dinner, you're going for an operation. Yeah, but you, you, you can't take things for granted these days. Oh, for I had shepherd's pie and peas. Suzanne made it from scratch. As nice as it was, it was annoying. Because making stuff from scratch means loads of pots and it's my job to do the washing up. So much as the food was nice, there was loads of pans and that. People who get their last dinner on death row don't have to wash up. Got up at 5.55. You were supposed to be getting up at 5.50 on the other page. You were yeah. five minutes late getting up. He's often late. Often late. No, it was just because I, I needed to have water. Before six o'clock they said, don't have anything after six. We'll get up at 5.50 then like you were planned to. Don't you had five minutes, minutes sleeping. Don't ten minutes to have water though, does it? Well, why'd you say 5.50 in the first place? Because then it tricks me head, doesn't it? Going, oh, I had an extra five minutes. Tricks me head. Because then it tricks me head. <laughs> it. Got to the hospital and had to wait in the waiting room. There was another nine people in there waiting to be sorted. I got called in. 
They sat me on a bed and took all my details down. Five minutes later I'd been knocked out. I got woke up when they were ripping a pipe out of my throat. I felt more rough this time. The doctor came to see me and said he couldn't find a stone, so I must have passed it. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah, we filled your kidney with water and expanded it and there was no hiding place. I sat in the recovery room for an hour while they found me a bed. One of the fellows who was sat in the room with me this morning got wheeled in. They couldn't wake him up. All the nurses were laughing because he didn't want to wake up. I bet they were laughing at me when I was in the theatre. Someone told me they totally strip you when they're operating. I would have looked like the alien on the Boswell incident. <laughs> Boswell! Boswell! <laughs> it's quite a nice analogy if it weren't for the fact that you said Boswell. <laughs> it's, it's the Roswell incident. Didn't sleep much through the night because there was a 60-year-old fella shouting at the nurse about his pillows. I don't think I slept through a full hour with one thing or another going on. My bed was next to the toilet, so I kept hearing the flush. How do they sleep in hospitals, though? They wake you up to give you fucking sleeping pills and things, don't they? How do you sleep in there? It's, it's always hot. It's always like 90 degrees. There's no air. Is that to make you drink water? I don't, I don't know what it is. There's no air. There's, there was an old fella across from me who kept breaking wind. He didn't even try and cover it. <laughs> he was just of that age where he didn't care. Just like, that's what I do. I'm in the hospital. Leave me alone. <laughs> what do you mean? Just, I, I don't know what was wrong with him. He's, uh, I talked to him because at first I felt sorry for him. I was a little bit like, you know, he's, he's had no visitors. Uh, no one's calling him up, so I'll talk to him. But then he got that familiar with me that he'd just be doing it whilst I'm chatting to him. Just like, he's my granddad or something. It's just like, oh, that's what he does. It's like, well, I'm ill as well. Stop doing that. <laughs> Honestly, unbelievable. He didn't even try and cover it with a cough. It was just like, that's... <laughs> Just non-stop. Got home and sat down. My pains are coming back, but the doctor said this would happen and that my insides are still in shock, so I need to take it easy. It's nine o'clock. I'm in agony. I can't do the diary for the rest of the day. Jesus. So you may as well just tell us then what happened. Right, well, yeah, after that, uh, went back in. Um, Suzanne just got frustrated with me because I was rolling about on the floor and she was trying to watch Arthur, right? <laughs> uh, so that was on the other night. Uh, Arthur and, was uh, with your lodger. So, um... And she said, look, if you're in pain, do something. She said, you know... You went and got a cold plate. Yeah. No, use an ashtray. Plates are for <laughs> liver damage. <laughs> she said, right, come on. Let's, uh... I just can't put up with this. It was like two o'clock in the morning. So we, we left the flat and what have you. Uh, got in a taxi. Um, he filled up on the way, which was annoying. <laughs> <laughs> he did it. That he is did. cheeky. That, that really, I mean, he could On the way to pain. the hospital. So, uh, Cause he's not an ambulance driver. Did you explain that to where you no, were going I, I was in that sort of thing where you just can't be bothered. Do you know what I mean? It was oh, in a sweat and stuff. He came back with a scratch card and some barbecue <laughs> briquettes. <yeah. laughs> so anyway, he gets us there and he doesn't charge us, which is pretty decent. Oh, that's alright, yeah. Um, so I go in and there's like, I don't know if you've been in like A&E at like you know, half two in the morning. Oh. It's just depressing. Fluorescent light doesn't help because it makes everyone look iller than they actually are. So, uh, in there there was, uh, a woman who was just sat there crying. She wasn't holding onto any part of the body, she was just sat there whinging. And when you're feeling bad, you've got that going on. So you just want to tell her to shut up. <laughs> there was a fella who was like moped over in a wheelchair, that's someone I just chucked in. Moped over? <laughs> it looked like somebody had just sort of found him and wheeled him Nurse? in. Nurse? Who's the guy moped over? <laughs> so this, this gay fella came through. And, How did uh, you know he was gay? Um. Just the way he was. I'm not having a go. He was a, he was a good fella. Do you know what I mean? A he doctor, was, you mean? No, he was like a, he was a nurse. Right. And he, he came through and just sort of went, oh, how are you? And I was like, oh, I've had better days. So he, he got As me you mentioned in the diary, I remember the first time when I came here, they said the nurse might put a tablet up my arse. I thought the chances of that happening had just increased. <laughs> oh, God! Yeah, but I, I would have let him do it, honestly. I was that sort of out of it. That of course you'd let him do it. He's a qualified nurse. No, but the way I am now, say if it was just a tablet for sorting out my blood pressure, mm. and I walked in there and he went, oh, hello, and he said, yeah, let's pop that, I'd go, hang on a minute. <laughs> but, but what I mean is, that night, I, I would have just let him put three up, honestly. <laughs> it's just weird, isn't it, how your body just goes, let him get on with it, and you let, you trust anyone, don't you, when, when you're in that much pain and you need And a, they're a qualified nurse, yes. Mm. They uh, in, gave me some morphine, and we sort of head caved in again like last time. And then the pain went. But anyway, um, just turns out that I, I'd had a load of, like, blood clots 
in the bit from my kidney to my bladder, and that was acting as a sort of a stone again. No, it's just, so that's it's just what, a scab, isn't it, where it's curing it? So. No, but all the work, when they blew up the kidney, they blew up the kidney four times its normal size, so there was no hiding place for the stone. Yeah. So when they did that, it caused a lot of blood, it must have ripped the sides of it and stuff. And then that blood was in the kidney, and it went down the pipe and blocked it up a little bit. And that's the pain that I had, it was sort of, had problems getting through all this thick blood that they caused. So, uh, the weirdest thing that happened when I was in there, right, uh, the, the morning, like, after I'd had the morphine and what have you, right, I slept pretty well. But I woke up and the, you have like a telly for your own bed. That, you, that you're allowed to use if you pay for it, right? So, so the glow from that woke me up because they come on at about ten past seven, and the telly's in front of your head, right? <laughs> so you're getting this glow and you're going, oh, what's that now? And uh, I looked at it, and all it had on written on it is, uh, Carl uh, received bad news about your father, right? And yeah. I was like, is this what they do now? Because it's such a big hospital that they just text your <laughs> sort of news to your bed. And I, I was kind of like, what's, like I say, it was early, it was ten past seven or whatever. Thinking, what's, what's going on? I, I didn't have my mobile, Suzanne took that. And I was looking at it, I read it again, I thought, Does, it might come up with more, like, what's up with him? <laughs> Turns out it was just a review for Neighbours. It just tells you... <laughs> it tells you what's on the telly that day. And there's some fella in Neighbours who's called Carl, whose dad went bad. <laughs> So that sort of woke me up a bit. I had a bit of a shock then. It was kind of like, Phew. so I was wide awake at like quarter past seven in the morning because my heart went a bit fast because I thought something had happened to me dad. Carl, of course, has written a poem about the experience entitled My Ward. All I've done here, I've been through a, you know, a, I don't know what the word is, a, a bad experience. Trauma. A trauma, yeah. I've been through a load of trauma. Mm. So I'm just finishing it off with a little sort of picture for people. Go on then. In my ward. I know it's called my ward. Me, a Chinese fella and an old bloke who looked like Mr Burns from The Simpsons. Don't know what was wrong with him, but breaking wind was the symptoms. No one visited him or called him. He seemed quite lost to me. As well as wind problems, he had a colostomy. Bye. When I left, I said see you to the old man. Turned out the other fella wasn't Chinese, he was from Japan. <laughs> I never found out what was up with him. You've got a little picture there, haven't you, of me sat in my ward. I'm sat there with that fella who I didn't talk to, the old fella who had wind problems, and that's what a poem is, isn't it? But the detail about you thought he was Chinese and he turned out to be Japanese, how is that evocative? That's just a m piece of misinformation. It's just I that, like it. I imagine a lot of people make it. I like same it, because you know why? It's like, he even makes digressions within his poem. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like he could have gone back and erased that, but he didn't. He left, he left that digression in, and I think that's, that's great. It's pretty honest. Yeah. So, you know, you've done quite, quite a few bits there from the diary, right? The other week you were saying a diary to sort of be famous and what have you, it's got to have a big event in it. That's a big event in my life, right? Mm. Peeps did a diary that had big events in it. You said about the fire on Pudding Lane. I had a kidney stone here. Eh? You write about puddings, you've had. So, is that now, is that as big as, is, is that a proper diary thing? It's but a proper diary anyway. I think, personally, the five or six pages you've written about your ill health are genuinely interesting, and I'm sure, in years to come, people, it will be an interesting evocation of the NHS, of this modern age, and how it is, what it's uh, like to be in hospital. What other diaries are out there? Well, a lot of them are fictional, of course, Bridget Jones and the like. There are lots of memoirs, but, but to publish I don't a whole diary, why. I mean, you can well, get... Well, the, the two most famous d diaries, I'd have thought, was Peeps and Anne Frank. But yeah. Kenneth Williams' diaries were published after his death. Many uh, celebrity diaries have been published. Alec Guinness, people like that. And is that just their last year, or did they do it when they were doing a lot? Because oh, if yeah. they're old and sort of not working well, a diary doesn't... isn't that good. Well, often the, the moments, you know, prior to their passing are some of the most interesting. You see their, their final thoughts and final days. Yeah, but are they just, you say different things when you're ill. When I was on that table about to go under and you're thinking this might be it, different thoughts on the world. Do you know what I mean? Different priorities. Such the most profound thing that you thought that you know it was because of your illness? Um, 
just as I went under, the last thing I said to this woman was, oh, you look different with that on. And, <laughs> and- <laughs> Oh, you look different with a hat on? Yeah, it was a woman who gave me the injection and she'd been round to the bed beforehand sort of saying, right, you're allergic to this, can you eat strawberries? And I was a bit like, why are you asking me that? And she went, well, no, a lot of people are allergic to strawberries. And I was saying, but is there any trace of strawberries in the stuff? And she's like, no, it's just that a lot of people are- and I said, well, no, I, I eat them. And then she's like, what about fish? And I said, I like some, I, but I haven't had them all. And, uh, <laughs> and then she turned to Sue at that point and said, what, do you know of anything he can't eat? She sort like of said- a, like, like turning to the mother? Yeah. When the child can't answer. And, but she, she was, this was this woman and she didn't have a hat on or anything. And then when I went down there, I didn't realise it was the same woman until I was lying there and she started to inject me. And I just said, oh, you look different with that on. And then I went out and, uh, and I, when I woke up, um, the woman sort of came round and just sort of said, oh, it's weird, that, that, that was the last thing, like you said. And, uh, that made me think that could have been my last, you know, like, fight them on the beaches or whatever. Uh, <laughs> that could have been my little thing. You look different with a hat on, Carl Pilkington. <laughs> oh God! In its own way, it is quite wise. People do look different with hats on. I, I think his last words would be something like, "Can this kill you?" Yeah. Suzanne, can you drink bleach? <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. That's the end of this series, the third series of the Ricky Gervais show. Um, we'll have to give it a rest for a while, won't we? I'm exhausted. Um, thank you everyone who, uh, um, bought the series, uh, uh, all 24 episodes we've ever done are available on iTunes, so, um, uh, yeah, if you haven't heard them, but maybe we should do a free one now and again over the coming years. Should we retire from podcasting and audiobooks? Uh, we've made our point, haven't we? I think we've made the point, yeah, I mean, you always leave them wanting more. And let's be honest, we passed that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, we may as well stop now as good a time as any. So for, so let, let's say, let's never say never, but for quite a while, um, it's goodbye from me, Ricky Gervais, Steve Merchant. Goodbye. And Carl Pilkington. All right. Monkey news, you little brown-headed. Right, years ago, uh, people only drank water, didn't they? <laughs> How long ago are we talking? Uh, going back a bit. Okay. Um, and it was just the norm, everybody was happy with that. It was kind of like, you know, what, you're thirsty, you have some water. It was just what you did. Um, well, and it was no, more of- Well, no, not only water. No, it was, it was kind of like- Well, they drank uh, milk at birth, didn't they? Yeah, as a baby. Mm. But then you don't you don't have that when you're older. What I mean is, there's more now. I've, as we've discussed, is more of everything. So I thought there was fruit juices in. Yeah, but what stuff. I mean, when people were thirsty, mm. it was it was like well, have water. They didn't go. Oh, what do you want? Do you want this? Do you want that? I'm, I'm just saying they yeah. had it for a purpose as opposed to uh, something on the on, for the taste buds. Right? Yeah. So um, so anyway, so this this town right, uh, it was in the middle of nowhere somewhere. Mm. Right? Um, it's the um, it's the detail that makes the story, yeah. isn't it? The, the the pinpoint accuracy of uh, you know. so it was a while ago, and it was in a town somewhere. Brilliant in the middle of nowhere. And what what used to happen is barrels used to appear, right? These sort of uh, do you know like how they have um, wooden barrels that beer and that comes in, right? Mm. One of those used to just be in this village, and everyone who lived there uh, w was used to this sort of drink that used to crop up, right? Well, because they were used to it, they didn't question it, it was kind of like, yeah, it's what happens if you live here. Sorry, so, I don't understand, so what's in the barrel? It's a barrel in the town square. Well, it's this drink. Right? And it's, so it's not water? It's not water. It's a mysterious it's, it's, other uh, drink. Well, it, it, I'll tell you now, it's, it's like a fruit drink. Okay. And back then, I mean, I, I speak to my mum and she didn't have a banana till she met me dad. And they were made up of fruit. Sorry, is that some euphemism? I don't know what that means. No, but what, what <laughs> yes. I mean, what I mean is- Was that is, he came a-calling with a banana. <laughs> no. With a bunch of bananas and some, uh, some flowers. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, but what I'm saying is, uh, it was like a fruit drink and for years and years people didn't drink fruit, it was an eating thing. Do you what? know what I mean? It, it was, was an eating thing. thing. It was an eating. 
Yeah, what, it, was, it was it was you thirsty, have some water. What you're hungry, have a banana, have an orange. Sure, or but the idea of combining the two, crazy. They never used them in that way. So anyway, so a mysterious fruit-based drink is turning up mysteriously in this town for years. No one questions it. No one thinks. Yeah, just, just think it's in that area. I'm sure, like in here the come the lilt man. No, but, lilt. but in the same way that in Scotland they'll have um, fried Mars bars and that, yeah. and they don't bat an eyelid at that. Yet when we go there, well, no, they go, well, they, well, they don't. They didn't appear mysterious. Really. <laughs> they didn't just appear go, one day. I assume they go to the news agents and take it home and pop it in some batter. I yeah, don't, I, but what I'm saying is they mm. don't think anything's odd about that. But as time goes on, people have started travelling more, haven't they? Ooh. And uh, you have visitors sort of came in to the to the town, to the town. and uh, mm. they were saying, "Oh, I'm a bit thirsty. Have you got any water?" Yeah, and they were like, like "Don't have water. Mm. Have uh, have some of that in that barrel." And they were like, "What's that?" And they were like, oh, it's a drink. So they had it. And it was really like refreshing. Cool. They were like, "What is this?" And they said, "Don't really know. It just crops up." <laughs> of course they did. No, it's what. Uh, no, it's what you get if you live here. It's part of living here. Right. So sure. they were like, "Brilliant! Do you sell this?" And no, they don't just sell it. We don't even know where it comes from. Just have some whilst you're here. You don't even know where it comes from. No. Okay. So the thing Bollocks. is, this this helped the uh, the town out. That's because, before the monkey appears. This shit. <laughs> yeah. So all these people are enjoying the drink. Mm. Word gets out, and yeah. it went on for a couple of years, but. They say it travels fast, doesn't it? If it's yeah. good, if it's good news, it travels. If it's good news or bad news, it travels fast. Yeah. Mm. So but, news uh, travels fast. Yeah, just news. Yeah, news just does. So um, mm. anyway, so some Fucking business monkey news doesn't. This is taking half an hour. So some big business fella oh. who was on oh. holiday in any it, specifics. He was from <laughs> uh, Chicago, right? Oh, interesting. And he, he flew. How tall was he? Hold on, though. So this is after Chicago was founded. Oh right. uh, yeah, Chicago was knocking about. Oh, they had loads of drinks then. Yeah, they had alcoholic. coffee, you know, tea, coffee, yeah. tea, alcohol. Yeah, they had every drink under the sun. Yeah, but not like every any, drink under the sun. Not like, Apple juice, grape no, juice, no, ciders, didn't. wines. Every just yeah. So, so he, he came. Oh, in. Chicago was founded. Then, he, uh, he came. Yeah, in probably nineteenth century. Oh, there's loads of shit about. And he was saying this drink you've got here, so it's good stuff, you know. Mm. Said, Whose is it? And they said, well. It just appears and what have you, and they said, "Well, that's a bit odd." Mm. So anyway, he, he got a bit annoyed with it because he wanted to take it back with him to Chicago. He yeah. knew there was an, an audience for this. Well, yeah, because they got bored of tea, coffee, coffee all the other drinks, all the other drinks and that. Yeah. So he uh, he waited Mead. at night. I'd been around for years. Waited at night. Waited behind a truck. Mm. <laughs> a, truck. <laughs> a truck. Oh, so, it's, uh, so oh, we're in a motorised age. Oh, so so uh, at least eighteen ninety <laughs> something. I'd have thought. Uh, and he saw this uh, little fella uh, bring the barrel out. How little was the fella? It's hard to tell in the dark, and they were quite far away, and the barrels, you know, it's, it's I mean, it's, tricky. it's hard it's to tricky. work out. Yeah. He uh, was short, his arms were long. So, um, so they followed him in, right, and, uh, saw what was going on. Okay. Like, how it was being made. Mm. And, uh, and they said, you know what, we, we can have a go at making this ourselves. And what happened in the end, they, they tried to imitate it in Chicago. Mm. Uh, there was a orangey tang, right? It was made by an orangutan, wasn't it? And, uh, do you know, grapefruit juice. Mm. They had, like, apefruit juice that, that they, they were good at crushing the fruit with the feet and what have you. And that's, that's how then too. So it was great ape fruit drink. Yeah. Which probably got abbreviated over time. Ape fruit, ape fruit, and no, ape fruit juice. No, no, it was great ape fruit drink, it was, cause it tasted great. That is a load of shit, Carl. That is why we stopped doing it.